Hello. Good evening. Selma High leadership students started out the semester by reflecting on the fall semester and setting personal goals for the rest of the school year. We also have been busy setting dates for all activities happening in the spring semester. To tackle planning our events, we have formed committees and participated in, le in lessons on topics such as active listening and respectfully disagreeing to support our collaboration. Along with our committee planning workshops, we are getting ready to support our senior athletes by making posters and setting up photo op stations for winter sports senior nights. Additionally, we we'll, we are excited to share that we have partnered with the site's special day classes and carved out time for students to come into the leadership room to work on social skills in a safe and supportive environment and build new friendships on campus. Last Friday was our first day of classroom visits and many students have shared that they had fun meeting new people and are looking forward to this week's visits. Bear Nation Athletics is heading into the second round of, tri of the Tri-County Conference. Lady Bears basketball had two great wins last week, defeating Hanford West and CVC, and travel to Kingsburg tomorrow to play the Vikings. Boys basketball is one of the division's top three teams. They are 16-4 and four this season. And Selma High will host the Kingsburg game this Wednesday night. Boy, uh, boys and girls wrestling host a tri-meet, host a league tri-meet, Tuesday versus Emmanuel and Reedley starting at 5 p.m. Boys and girls soccer are completing the first, the first round of TCC play with girls playing at Hanford West on Tuesday and hosting Washington Union on Thursday. The boys are playing Kerman on Wednesday and travel to Reedley on Friday. Spring sports is getting started and we are excited that the weather is improving. Thank you. Great job. Thank you so much. Next, we're moving on to... Uh... Charisma and Mariah. Yeah. Yes, yes. Spelling Bee, congratulations to our Spelling Bee winners. I'm sorry for advance if I've said your name wrong, but the first place winner was Curdy Tohan. Andrew Nato, second place. Manpreet Carr, third place. And in eighth grade, Abram Arcos Rodriguez was in first place. Victoria Garcia was in second place. And Lorenzo Moran was in third place. Moving on to Selma High next Monday at 6 p.m., Selma High is hosting the Moving On to Selma High event where all eighth grade students and parents have been invited to learn more about the electives, pathways, and extra, extracurricular activities that Selma High School has to offer. Additionally, next Wednesday, thir Wednesday and Thursday and Friday during eighth grade lunch, various CTE programs from Selma High School will be on the ALMS campus to answer any questions students may have about their classes. Academic awards, Thursday, February 2nd and at 6 p.m., in the ALMS gym, we will be holding our first trimester academic awards. We will be honoring those students with perfect attendance, A and B honor roll and principals honor roll. Athletics, basketball, soccer, and wrestling are nearing the end of their season. You can come and cheer on our basketball and soccer teams next Monday and next Wednesday. Our next wrestling meet will be next Tuesday in the ALMS cafeteria. Thank you. Thank you so much. Congratulations to all the spelling bee winners and even the ones that didn't win are still champions for even attempting to spell some of those words. Congratulations. Next on the agenda is um, site leader reports. Before we go to site leader reports, I wanted to read something out of our governance handbook. And it is, um, what is our purpose? We are a leadership team responsible for the realization of the mission of our district while being fiscally responsible with the public monies in our trust. We consider the future as well as the present and maintain our focus on our mission, vision, and goals that were developed through the inclusive processes. We have the responsibility to do the best job we can for our students within the state and federal requirements. 
to consider the whole child and to provide necessary resources to families in crisis. We believe that all students can learn and want our students to graduate from our schools able to become responsible citizens. We provide a physically and emotionally safe, comfortable environment that encourages learning. We set high expectations for staff, expect staff to continue to learn and grow and to believe that failure is not an option. We see that the necessary resources are available to our staff to do the work we expect of them and have an evaluation system in place that holds everybody. Uh, let's see. That holds everybody accountable, starting from the superintendent. We inspire, engage, and inform our staff and community about our education issues on behalf of our students, our district, our teachers, and public education. Moving forward, uh, site leaders. Uh, Mr. or uh, Dr. Pickle. Mr. Dr. Pickle. <laughs> All that works. Thank you. Um, what's going on at uh, Selma High School? We have a big game we invite you to this Wednesday. Of course, uh, it's going to be a it's going to be a good night. Um, and moving on from that, Adam already spoke about that. We have current registration going on for our ninth through eleventh grade. Um, our goal by this Friday is to be about ninety percent complete, so we can begin the master schedule process. Of course, we all know that drives everything we do. Um, but about ninety percent of those in the system. Um, and then we're going to chase down that other 10%. Those are students that have missed their registration day. Um, but once we get those in, then we're going to focus on our incoming freshmen. Um, I'm sure Mr. Lane's going to be able to talk about moving on a little bit, so I won't steal his thunder, but that's uh, January 30th. And right after that um, is a CTE showcase, which he'll touch on. But more importantly, we have our ALMS registration days February 6th and 7th. So right after February 6th and 7th, we should be able to look at our numbers and begin to ferret out exactly um, what our needs are at Selma High School. And then we will um, operate our own CT showcase on February 10th on campus, which is gonna highlight internally our CT programs for our students. Um, this will be the first time we've done that um, for our current students to be able to choose um, and to understand what type of CT pathways that they have available to them. Um, and then looking way forward, I want to invite you to our open house on March 9th uh, at 6 p.m. So thank you. Thank you. Mr. Lane. Good evening. A uh, couple of things going on at, at ALMS that I wanted to highlight. Um, ever since we got back from winter break, our attendance has really skyrocketed. Uh, the last week prior to winter break, really the last eight to 10 days, we had hit a little bit of a plummet, and I checked with other principals in the district. Seemed pretty similar to um, what they were experiencing, but we're up over 95% average uh, since we've returned. Uh, this past Friday was our highest attended Friday of the year so far, so I was really happy to see that. Um, not only does the enrollment continue to grow, but the percentage of students that are there continues to grow. And so that's something that we want to keep going. That's great momentum uh, that we're seeing. The moving on to Selma High, one week from tonight, uh, we've been in collaboration with the high school. Uh, one, one of our missions is to really have the high school and, and middle school really join forces and, and make this as seamless as possible. So thanks to VROP and Fabrizio and, and Dre have... Um, helped us brainstorm on ideas to entice our eighth graders to get there. And they've came up with uh, some food trucks and our eighth grade students get a ticket. And with that ticket, they get a free meal at the food truck to attend that evening. Uh, we're hoping that that drives up attendance uh, as well. And then subsequent to that, on the Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, we have CTE week where every CTE program will be highlighted at lunch. Um, we'll do half on Wednesday and half on Thursday. Uh, for our seventh graders as well, they won't be quite there yet. And, and especially for our eighth graders, 
And then Friday will be the Ag Olympics, which is a pretty big event on campus. It's the first time, uh, as far as I've been told, that um, the CTE programs have been highlighted in, in totality there at ALMS. So students get a really good idea of all that's offered at the high school and everything that they are uh, welcome to join. Uh, and then lastly, uh, in the next two weeks, we'll be starting after school program once a 10 with, again, with a CTE uh, flavor. Uh, we'll have robotics and then we'll be doing patient care slash health science and criminology slash CSI uh, coming over from the high school. It'll be one day a week, kind of a nice intro for our students uh, every Wednesday, and we're going to run that uh, for two months. So that's any questions or? Okay, thank you. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Not um, to put anybody on the spot, but is uh, David Deal here? Yes, he is. Can you give us a little update? <laughs> Not to put you on the spot. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Did you need a report from me? I just need yeah. to know. Just give us a little what's yeah, going on. Sure. Uh, We're excited. Well, a two A is rolled out. That's exciting, and, and I'm going to say that you know Mr. Lane's improvement in attendance. We, we're going to take a, a little bit of credit for that, and that the letters, six thousand letters, went out to families. Um, I think it was it started some really good conversation about the importance of attendance and turned what might have been positive conversations. So that was wonderful. In my first in my first school week here, and amazing. Everybody's extremely welcoming. Well. A2A part, we're gonna start uh, we um, circled back with A2A so that they're for our front office staff as they're learning the system and we can improve that and then also work with our site admin on developing the frameworks around um, those systems and how a2a can benefit them as well so that's the report from <laughs> thank you so much okay. i didn't mean to put you on the spot no, i'm just really okay. excited and uh just wanted to hear a little bit about what's going on yeah no good things good thank things. you yes, does thank anybody you. have any questions <clears throat> nope when Thank you. you. Right. When oh, Estella. When did you roll it out? So, well, technically it rolled out a couple of weeks ago, but the letters went out last week okay. and went into our second batch. They come out uh, once a week. Um, so because it was a mid-year, it everybody was due for letters from the first semester. Uh, this Seventy or eighty that are and not subtracting any, which means that every family's um, that's due one is 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 getting one. That's good and it allows us to start looking at our data around our chronically absent students, um, and then implement our interventions more effectively. Okay. Any issues with uh, getting them out? Pardon me? Any issues with getting them out because that's a, a large amount? No, well, that's the great thing about A2A is they they mail them for us automatically. Oh, okay. So that's taken that responsibility uh, off the site. And that's part of their service for us is they extract the information out of our ARIES student information system based on the data that's in there. And they queue up the letters. They're already printed. They're already pre-signed by the individual principal. And then we get to review them. And once we say a okay, or we don't respond at all, we don't say anything, they just send. Well, there's, so. there's not too much for the, the site to do. Mm -hmm. Not in that regard. I mean, the, the critical thing around <clears throat> for the sites, and that's what we freeze them up, is student did miss, reconcile the absences. Barrier is we can identify why they aren't getting through, and then we can do that. That's the critical part of improving our attendance is identifying the barrier and then removing. Okay, and we'll be looking forward to updates. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Uh, moving forward, uh, uh, just a minute. I think do I have an elementary principal ready? Yes. 
Yeah, okay. Mrs. Sapuentes was scheduled to uh, talk about Indianola. So thank you. Good evening, Madam President, board members, Dr. Shepard, and the executive committee. Thank you for um, allowing me to present to you tonight to provide an update for Indianola. We are continuing to focus on our success pillars, academics, behavior, social emotional learning, and attendance. We recently participated in the Selma uh, District Spelling Bee when we took first place for our fourth grade, Isaac Cortez Garabi. And fifth grade took second place, Amelia, excuse me, Emily Munoz. We are very proud of our Indianola Warriors. Um, we are working very hard to build relationships with students and families to address issues before they interfere with academics. Most recently, we hosted a donut with, with dear ones, which is an event that allows students to spend quality time with a dear loved one. They shared a donut, milk, coffee, and this was all done before school. And we had nearly, we had close to 500 participants. That came mm, wow. Our whole cafe, entire cafeteria, thank you, was completely full. So that was definitely a success. And parents asked for more additional events oh. uh, such as that so that they can just bond and have that quality one-on-one -on -one time. So that was really a success. Our winter program was also a success. So we had about 500 people in attendance there, uh, filled up the cafeteria. Uh, we're continuing with our attendance rewards. We have Crazy Karen, who provides a fun and energetic um, assemblies on a monthly basis so that to help students work towards their goal of 97% attendance. Um, one of our Indianola strengths is our, is our staff. Our caring and dedicated team goes the extra mile for our students. They support each student to feel very positive and help students work through their daily struggles that they may be that they may be occurring in their lives. Um, um, after our morning um, morning announcement with the Positivity Project, staff promotes and encourages positive mental health by teaching students to self-identify their current feelings and then teach them how to cope and teach them those coping skills so that they can push through it and learn how to deal with with life's events. Uh, this empowers students to be resilient and push through life's struggles. We promote a positive message of inclusion and kindness on our campus. In addition to, pro to providing social and emotional support, our teachers are doing a phenomenal job with our math mastery. Our teachers and our teachers and students are working hard and they are doing a great job because our scores are improving. And I attribute this all to our dedicated staff and they're doing a great job. And that's it. Thank you. I have a question. Sure. When you were talking about teaching them coping skills, give me a couple of examples of coping skills. Um, we have students, for example, if they are feeling um, lonely, like they don't have any friends. We work really hard with um, the leadership students to reach out and to make friends, help them teach them those skills on maybe um, if they're too shy, to teach them, um, uh, as I mentioned, leadership to, to befriend them and show them how to um, engage with other students. Our PBIS person on our campus, she's awesome. And she works with them on how to make a friend just that communication on what to do and what to say to get them out of their comfort zone, but actually to give them a skill in, in learning, learning, learning how to make friends because it's, it's difficult. Mm -hmm. And um, I would say another one is um, students that are having trouble with, for example, keeping the, their hands to themselves, you know, maybe rough playing, things like that. We teach them other ways of showing their excitement or um, um, the proper way to, you know, maybe hug a friend or hug a buddy or things like that, but not in the way of pushing or um, hitting those type of things. So those are just a couple of examples of teaching them skills, how to push through that. Oh, that's great. Does any, that's, thank you for sharing that. I was, Absolutely. does anybody have any questions? Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have anyone else? No, I don't think so. No. I don't believe so. Oh, 
Did I have someone else, Raquel? Rosa. Well, Rosa's up for, for um, the adult school, so okay. All right, I Ready? think we're good. Okay, so we'll move on to um, number eight, public input. Members of the public are wishing to address the Board of Education on matters within the jurisdiction of the board, but not on the agenda may do so during the public comment period for up to three minutes. Public comments on specific agenda items are heard under that item. For the public record, please state your name. And we're moving on to nine, discussion and action items, superintendent. Okay, I don't believe we have any cards, right? No, okay. All right, so um, the first one is adopt a resolution, <clears throat> the celebration of Black History Month in February, 2023. Do you have someone that like to read the resolution? Would you like to read it, um, Mark? Here, I have a co hard copy. I'd be easier to read a hard copy. Yeah, uh, well. I'm the same way. I'm old school. <laughs> yeah, I'm the same way. Thank you for not picking me. Oh, I should have picked you. No. You're next. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. The radio voice? Yeah. <laughs> hey, Sound Unified School District Board of Trustees Proclamation proclaiming that the celebration of Black History Month in February 2023, whereas African American slash Black History Month is an annual observance to recognize the significant roles African Americans have contributed in our nation's and community's history. Your contributions to arts, entertainment, law, politics, sciences, sports, and more. And whereas the history of the African-American Black History Month tracks back to 1915, when the father of Black History Month, Dr. Carter G. Woodson, introduced the first Negro History Week in February 1926. Whereas in 1976, Black History Month was formally adopted to honor and affirm the importance of Black history to the American experience and includes some of the greatest, most advanced and innovative societies in our history from which we can draw inspiration. And whereas due to determination, hard work and perseverance, African-Americans have made valuable and lasting contributions in Selma, Fresno County, the state of California and the United States, achieving notable success throughout the society, including business, education, politics, science and the arts. And whereas, Selma Unified School District and the Selma community are strengthened and enriched by the diversity of cultures and traditions that are a cornerstone of our region and our rich, diverse social tapestry. And whereas all students need the opportunity to understand the common humanity underlying all people, to develop pride in their own cultural identity and heritage, and to respect and accept the identity and heritage of others. <clears throat> and now therefore, the Selma Unified School District Board of Education does hereby proclaim the month of February 2023 as National Black History Month. Staff, students, parents, and the community are encouraged to observe, recognize, and celebrate the culture, heritage, and contributions of Black Americans to our country, our state, our cities, and our schools. Thank you. Do I have a motion to, um, uh, uh, to adopt the proclamation? I move. Estella, Estella. I'll well, second. And Mark second. Motion has been passed to adopt proclamation proclaiming the oh, all in vote. favor. <laughs> Aye. 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 Opposed. Motion has passed to adopt a proclamation proclaiming the celebration of Black History Month in February 2023. Thank you. Uh, moving forward. Dr. Shepard, adult school presentation. So I'd like to invite our adult school team, uh, led by uh, Mrs. Rosa Bali, the new principal. Well, she's she's new there, but anyway. So welcome, and I'll let you take it from here. They've done a oh, here's some uh, copies. Testing. Just want to make sure. Okay. So uh, thank you for this executive board and board members. It is my pleasure. Uh, to talk a little bit about our adult program and uh, what's going on there. I'd like to preface this is my sixth week on the physician. So I am learning as we go along and it's been a phenomenal experience to get to work with the adult staff, the work, the, the staff that's there, as well as our adult learners. 
so with that, I'd like to go to the first slide just to share a little bit about the, the beginning of this school year. So our adult program, now all our classes are being held at, at the Washington campus. So this campus now serves as a central location for our community, as well as provides easier access for our students and is an optimal location for the clientele that we serve. Um, also, our staff has had the opportunity to get to know each other uh, because in, in before coming over to Washington, we had classes offered at Selma High, we had Eric White, and we had Hartman. So this now unites all the staff members to get to know each other and know uh, who is working for this program. And uh, to talk a little bit about our staff, our staff includes myself, the principal. Uh, facilitator is uh, Mrs. Desiree McDougal. She's sitting right over here. And we also have... Um, eight, six, six adult independent study program instructors. We have seven ESL instructors. We have day and evening custodians. We have an administrative assistant, an office assist, assistant, a data accountability specialist, and a bilingual instructional aide. So quite a bit of, of staff there. And going on to the next slide. So what are the programs that are offered in uh, the Selma Adult School? So to start off, we have the Adult Independent Study Program known as AISP. And this supports our adults in our community to earn a high school diploma. And uh, we currently have 88 students enrolled, which is the maximum amount of spaces that we have with the instructors. Uh, we have six teachers and each has either uh, they either have full days, evening times, or a combination of both. And uh, we just completed our spring enrollment for uh, that we just had it the week of January 9th through the 12th. Uh, so that has already taken place. And today was actually our first day. Um, our ESL classes, we offer them both in the morning and in the evening. Uh, we have six different levels uh, from pre-lit all the way to advanced. Um, and our placement levels are based on the GASAS test, which is the Comprehensive Adult School Assessment, assess, assessment System. So that is taken twice, uh, twice a year. So that lets us know in what level uh, our students are placed. Um, seven classes that we have, and that's a combination, as I said, AM and PM. And our spring registration was just held last week. Uh, so that went very well and, and quite busy. Uh, we also offer a civic slash conversation classes and twice, twice a week. And uh, basically these are activities that integrate civics education and our ESL instruction. So we have objectives, we have language uh, and literacy objectives, uh, civics objectives, and they also have the co-op test that they take. And this helps us with funding uh, from the state. And uh, the next program is our next slide is our intro to computers. And this is offered uh, once a week on Tuesdays and that's based on enrollment. And so far we, we have a nice enrollment of about 17 uh, students for the spring. Um, so we had a class in the fall and again offered this spring. And this class is to help our, our uh, students increase their skills and open up new uh, opportunities for them. We also have Reedley College on our campus and they offer non-credit uh, non courses. And our team of Reedley College, uh, they have joined us to help with the registration and provide information to any of the, the adult learners that are interested. Uh, for the fall, our classes included today's receptionist, data entry with QuickBooks. So that was the fall. And for the spring, we're offering Microsoft Word, word processing projects, and beginning keyboarding. So those are our really college courses. Uh, we also have the uh, adult transitions program, and that's, that's known as ATP. And we have uh, one teacher, Mrs. Ruby Alvarado, and she'll be speaking a little bit about that in a few slides, a uh, few of the upcoming slides. We have two, pro two program aides, Rosie Saldate and Connie Hernandez. 
And we will also be having a county ATP class that's going to start after spring break. So that is uh, on its way. And we also have our, VAG, our uh, Valley Regional uh, Occupational Program known as VROP. And uh, Fabrizio, our, uh, the superintendent for Valley ROP, he'll be talking a little bit about the, cl uh, the classes that are offered there. And so on the next slide, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, something new that uh, we have put in place is uh, we have Mary Lopez. She's from the, uh, the state consortium and she is our transition specialist. And what some of the things that she does uh, is we have an orientation meeting and then the students take a test and then we assign them to an instructor. So orientations are held every Thursday at 10 o'clock for students registering for the uh, independent study program. The evening orientations are offered, uh, will be offered every other Thursday and we'll start this week with that. And that's at 5.30. Uh, and, and really the purpose is for Mary to get to create a rapport with the students that she'll be servicing. Uh, she shares wonderful resources that are available from community college, VROP, the workforce, and she also provides assistance with college and financial aid applications. So just a gem for, for us and our students in, in what she has to offer. And each, each uh, semester, she meets with the students once a semester, and it's just to talk to them about you know, their goals and how it's going and any, any help that they need with anything that uh, they're, they're pursuing. Um, so that, that's, gonna, that's going well with that. Uh, she's also going to assist with uh, what we call reg to go which is registration to go and that's an event for those students that are in the adult independent study program that will be uh, graduating and so that's going to be held april 27th of uh, this year we also will have uh well uh really college and proteus uh you, you know what i apologize I, I see that i skipped something so let me finish this the reg to go uh, and this will be a one-stop shop for, for our classes. So going back up to the one point that I missed, the resource fair for Selma students in our community will be held April 20th. And this is going to be an event uh, where we have colleges, businesses, the Selma Police Department, the Fire Department, and Proteus. They'll all be there to share what opportunities they have here in our community. So this will allow our students to be able to uh, meet all these different uh, organizations and possibly see what's, what's available for them. So that's going to be the resource fair that's held April 20th. The reg to go is April 27th. Um, also listed is the college tour. Uh, there is a college tour taking place on May 9th. And this is open to our students in the adult uh, program. They will have the opportunity to tour a campus and uh, the event will be held at 10 to one and lunch is provided. It's always nice to have a meal in there because it's a motivator. Um, in addition to uh, another event or another uh, support, we will have a resume workshop and that's scheduled on uh, March 16th. And this is an evening event for students interested in creating a resume. So the students that uh, leave uh, who come to the uh, to the support area for their um, resume? Uh, they'll be they'll get a they'll walk out with the resume. So that is uh, another support for our students. And uh, we also just will start on February third. It's our first distribution. It's our district food bank. Um, and like I said, that's we're just starting that. So the next slide will show a little bit about the central food bank. There we go. So uh, first and foremost, I want to uh, acknowledge the team that has helped support this and get this going off the ground. So we have Dr. Wildman, who is who is uh, worked with us. We have Alicia Gonzalez, uh, Desiree McDougall, Ruby Alvarado. We have uh, Eduardo Alvarez from Selma High, Christy Rangel and the Key Club, as well as myself. Um, so this is a, a collaborative effort between uh, the Central California Food Bank and Selma Unified. Uh, there is no cost to Selma Unified as this is a grant that is funded uh, through the Central California Food Bank. 
Uh, we will serve, we hope to serve. Our goal is uh, to serve 200 families uh, in our community per month. And our financial allotment, this is what we had fun with. Uh, and when we were placing our first order, uh, we have a minimum of 4,800 and we and the max is 5,000 and that's per month. So we just received the training where we sat down and, and uh, had the opportunity to uh, look at how we are gonna place orders. And so we go through a shopping list and there's various things that are on that list and it, and it changes uh, month to month and some items are free. And so we definitely wanted to bank on, on those items that, that were free. So then uh, we placed the order and then we received the order the following week. So as a matter of fact, tomorrow uh, will be our first order delivery. Um, and we will, we will have these funds uh, through June of 2023. And again, that's we're looking at Central Food Bank again, uh, getting another grant for uh, the next school year. Um, we will have the graphic design class from, the Sel from Selma High. They're gonna be helping by designing the recyclable bags. Uh, we also have students from our adult transition program that's on campus. They're going to be supporting uh, by keeping track of the inventory and filling orders. So they're gonna be a, a great force in, in this, uh, this, uh, this, 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 this event that we're gonna be doing monthly. Um, we also have um, the Avid and Key Club students who will be helping with the distribution. Uh, and at the same time, we'll also count, uh, the, they'll count these hours as voluntary hours. Uh, we will have a referral process. Um, this first time we did not have a referral process. We just went through and selected things that uh, we felt uh, were needed and would, uh, would definitely help families. Uh, but an act, the actual referral process that we'll pull in, we'll start is going to begin with our adult ESL classes. And that's just to get an idea of really what is it that uh, our adults in our community uh, see as, as a need. And then uh, this will help us um, familiarize ourselves with this process. And then we will also then move to our migrant program as well as our school site. So we'll have our social workers uh, help with this process. So next slide. So just some, some basic additional information. Uh, for the fall, uh, we had an average of 27 students per class for our ESL. Uh, the civic, civics conversation classes averaged about 21 students per class. Our computer class that's held on Tuesdays, we averaged about 16 students. And our built independent study uh, program uh, they were able to uh, get through 104 students. Uh, and those were uh, students that will have students finish the program. And then we bring in new students that are on the wait list. And for uh, the fall, uh, we have 27 graduates. And then of course, we'll have more coming in the spring. Uh, so that number will increase. And then the funding for the adult education program services, it's provided through state funding, and this is the California Adult Education Program. And that is through, uh, through the classes that we offer and assessments that they take, all that is, uh, is worth points. And those points then uh, convert into money, funding. And we have federal funding, which is uh, the WIOA, and this is going in and out. And the WIOA is the Workforce uh, Innovation Opportunity Act. Uh, and the Adult Education Family Literacy Act. And so uh, we just completed, and this was due uh, December 15th, I believe, the uh, WIOA grant for the next four years. The grant that we're currently on was, uh, is good for three years. This is the last year of that grant. And so the, uh, the notice of intent to award is going to be posted on February 15th, right after uh, Valentine's Day. So we are greatly anticipating uh, the news on that. Um, and so with that, are there any questions? I have a question um, yeah. on that uh, resources fair. Um, I know there's uh, some agencies that you guys could have uh, invite them, high-speed rail, 
they have a big office here in Selma. And also I was thinking on Sheriff Department, Fresno counties, yeah. they hires all the times and well as the city of Selma, Chamber of Commerce. And maybe if you guys could add on there and maybe they could let the local businesses know. Most right. definitely. I will follow up with the mayor, our transition specialist who's helping organize that. And I'll definitely share that with her. Thank you, Mr. Sahoda. Thank you. Yes. So you're saying that we're we are just getting done with one for your grant. And so what? we're anticipating that. Oh. Yeah, yeah. We this is the last year of the of the of a three year grant uh, that was written. So yeah, we're finishing up that grant, and the grant that was just written is now a, would be a four year grant. Okay. All right. We just want to make sure. Yes. So and then that yeah, the new grant we'll find out on February fifteenth. So it's not solidified that we have it. It's still technically in the air. Correct. Okay. Uh, but the good thing is we met the first criteria, which is all this information on enrollment and what was offered. So that was number one to even have the opportunity to work on the application. So that's a good sign. You know, we have we met that, and uh, all the questions. There was various questions, and of course, I I relied heavily on I would say uh, Desiree, who's been in the program for several several years. Uh, our adult, our secretary there that has ran, helped run the program for many years. So a lot of the information that was put in, okay, goes in and out. Um, I relied on on their support uh, to get all that valuable information in. So any contingency in case we don't get it? Uh, you know what? Or does it look like we're pretty it's much pretty gonna be... It's pretty routine. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It's not something competitive. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, good to know. <laughs> no, it's pretty routine. As long as you fill in all the boxes and, and they got all filled in. Dr. I know. Dr. She, first time she wrote it <laughs> and she labored over it and did a phenomenal job. So yeah. good. We're, we're good. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for all the information. Absolutely. And so with that, I do want uh our some adult uh uh transition our ATP program to come up and share a little bit. There's two slides there. Uh, it's going to be the next slide, the Selma Adult, there we go. And then after her, then we're going to have Mr. Fabrizio. He's going to present uh, on the VROP, and he brought two students along with them to share uh, their experience. Okay, thank you. So I want to, <clears throat> the previous board, um, we opened the adult transition program here in Selma. Uh, last year was the first year uh, because our, the county adult school transition program did not have enough slots for our kids. Plus, I'm a real believer that your students should be stay in their community versus being sent to a um, surrounding community because they have to learn to live within their own community. So uh, there was twofold to keep our kids here. We have invited <clears throat> the adult, the Fresno County Office of Ed asked if there was space for a program for theirs. So they are joining us on the campus, but our focus is um, our kids and, and keeping them here. So it helps. Um, we get asked a lot to house programs for the county because of our location to the freeway. Mm -hmm. And we're kind of central for some of the surrounding areas. So anyway, so Ruby was our first teacher who took this on and uh, uh, has kind of fledgingly started this. And I think this year is much better than the first year, right? So I just want to acknowledge her work and her staff, the pe folks that with all, her whole team have done a phenomenal job engaging our kids. So we're glad you're here tonight, Ruby. <clears throat> okay. Uh, can you guys, is that working? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Wonderful. All right. Good evening, Board President Alanis, Board Members, Dr. Shepard, Executive Cabinet. So it's our pleasure tonight just to give you a little overview of the Adult Transition Program, which is located at Washington. Um, as Dr. Shepard said, it's really expanded this year. The very generous board, along with the Executive Cabinet, did approve a ban for our students to be transported to work sites, and that's really opened up so many opportunities for our students. Um, last year, it's it's really hard to go to work sites because they go to multiple work sites and uh, Ms. Alvarado will share with you in just a moment where they go, um, but it's been great for them to independently be able to go to work sites and get really wonderful job skills. So the adult trans 
transition program is basically a program for our 18 to 22 year old special education students that did not get a high school diploma. They got a certificate of completion. And really the goal of the program is to make our students independent as possible. So after they leave us at 22, even though they got a certificate of completion, they want to uh, work They, You know, we work on resumes with them. We work on interviewing skills, job skills, um, potentially connecting with Reedley College, taking some DSPS classes there. So we really, really want to work on their independence and just everything for their life after they leave us. So it's a really busy four years <laughs> that they have with us because again, we wanna just make them as independent as possible. Um, and so we do a lot of community-based community based instruction. Uh, you will rarely go by Washington and find uh, Ms. Alvarado and her students in the classroom because they are out at job sites, which is really exciting. So they might be at the thrift store, um, scanning things, uh, making prices for things, hanging stuff up. They go to the pool store. Uh, they do all sorts of really, really awesome things like that. Um, and it's really, really fun to watch them. If you ever want to see our students at work at a job site, um, let just let us know and we can set that up for you. Um, they have been really involved with the um, trans, uh, Families in Transition program, especially with the food bank and handing out food. Dr. Wildman had mentioned to me that the program was going to be there. And I said, oh, that's wonderful. Please put our students to work. So that's kind of a wonderful experience for them as well. And then, it, and again, just we really want to just give them an age appropriate spot to really learn again, all those independent living skills, social skills, all the skills they're going to be using for the rest of their life, um, <laughs> budgeting skills, a lot of real world skills. And we want them to leave us at 22 wanting more. We don't want them to just want to sit at home. We want them to leave with really valuable skills that they've learned in those four years that they've been with us. So uh, with that, Ms. Alvarado is going to specifically go into exactly what sites they're at and kind of what, what they do during the school day. Just excuse me, excuse me for a second before you start. I cannot concentrate because I'm freezing to death. Is the heater on? The doors are open up there too. Am I the only one that's cold? You're cold. Bring it in. I'm going to bring my own heater. <laughs> Good evening, my name is Ruby Alvarado. This is my second year as the adult transition program teacher. Um, ATP is currently collaborating with Sama Unified School District and Central California Food Bank to provide food and personal necessities that individuals may need in our community. Students will keep track of inventory and organize the deliveries from the food bank. Students will be learning life skills throughout the process on keeping track of inventory, packaging, <clears throat> budgeting, and also organization skills. So today was actually our first day. We stocked up um, our shelves with necessities that students may need um, in our school district or families. Um, tomorrow we'll get our first delivery uh, from the food bank. So we're excited to get that at noon and stock the shelves. And we already have a student that will keep track of inventory um, organization skills, and then we'll be practicing packaging as well as uh, keeping track of expiration dates. Um, ATP students work at sites throughout the week, uh, such as Second Chance Animal Shelter, Lala's Thrift Store, Carrie's Fashion, Valley Life Community Church. Um, we also, this year, we went to the Fresno Fair for the educational program. So I had about five students volunteer. Uh, all those four days they were scheduled and they saw thousands of students and they were assigned different exhibits. So it's a great experience for our students. They were up at, um, I picked them up such as early as 630 and they were ready with their uniform, with their badge, um, ready to go to work. So it was an amazing experience too. And they were dedicated. It was five hours. They were dedicated. They, they loved talking to the children. Um, their favorite one was the ag exhibit. So they really enjoyed that this year. <clears throat> students have volunteered at Caps and Kingsburg. We go there every Friday. Um, also Clear Image Pool in Selma, as well as Selma Senior Center. The ATP program is 
always adding work sites and making community connections based on students' career interests. Um, a program we have is the Path for Explore. It is used in a classroom setting to um, have ATP students do virtual job shadowing for the different careers. So they're really uh, interested. They learned different careers that there is and every day ask them, okay, what are you interested in? And then they choose the video. So it's really nice to see it virtually and job shadow those careers. Um, some stuff that we provide is vocational skills, which is uh, job readiness, community-based work experience, and job seeking. Another um, area that we support on independent living skills, they love cooking in the classroom. We have made lasagna, um, chicken alfredo, chilaquiles. <laughs> so we have really enjoyed doing cooking and meal planning. Um, we also do shopping. You will see us at Walmart many times <laughs> um, budgeting for the week. Um, so we also uh, will be receiving a washer and dryer to practice laundry and household cleaning, as well as personal care, health, and hygiene. Thank you. Oh, yes. And I, I just wanted to add one more thing. So we actually get a grant every year from the CDE um, right around $50,000. And so that grant actually goes to pay our students minimum wage while they actually work at these job sites. And so we've, um, Selma Unified has had the grant for the, at least the last 10 years. And so once these students go out, they actually do get paid through that grant for their work at work sites. Thank you. That's awesome. It's just really exciting to hear all that going on. And that, that's all out of the Washington site, right? Yes. Hey, what a, just a big difference. Thank you, ladies. We super appreciate that. Thank you. Tom. Anybody have any questions? So we have more. So just okay. to let you know, come on up, Fabrizio. Um, when I first started teaching, I taught the adult school transition program with Crescent County Office of Ed. So, well, our kids only got 50 cents an hour, but anyway. So we have been doing some refurbishment of the site, the next two slides i mentioned it last time i think we flipped them up gentlemen yes it's uh, there yeah so um we, we there was carryover from the adult school program funds and we and they allowed us to keep it so we're using those funds to refurbish this is what it looked like before and then the next rooms will show what they're turning out right now so we're really excited about that each of the adult school classes will have a washer dryer as well, because the students will be learning that. So that's being installed. And uh, the goal is the entire site interior early will be redone uh, within the year. So we're excited about it. So I invited Fabrizio to be here tonight because CTE has got an amazing connection with us and um, with them all on the same site, it's been exciting. And one, one, one of the programs, Mr. Sahota was particularly uh, excited to have started in our district and our community. So I'll turn it over to Mr. Uh, the superintendent of Lafaro here for this section. So thank you for being here. Dr. Shepard, thank you. Uh, Madam President Alanis, uh, members of the board, members of the cabinet, and uh, Mr. Sahura is now our board president for Valley OP. So uh, Mr. Fodor is uh, the alternate. So thank you for being there. And uh, quickly, I'll go through. I just wanted to uh, let you know, uh, one of the ways that we do career tech ed, and this is a really a partnership. We've been in a partnership <laughs> with Selma Unify for 52 years now. Um, in a JPA agreement. When we set up uh, CTE courses, we have to look at labor market indicators. We have to look at where are the jobs? We can't just create classes because we like to. And uh, one of the things we use is, uh, again, the labor market for the central mother load region, which is Stockton through Bakersfield. And then we look at also what employers are telling us, because that's very important through our area, what they need. Um, and um, for adult tests specifically, but also for our high school programs, for adult tests specifically, we need to make sure that the courses give industry certifications. I always say we can't set up circus tents without a circus inside. Okay, so we need to make sure that we have things that students get certified and they can move on. Short-term CT courses where students get, get trained within between five weeks and 18 weeks or within a semester. 
and they can advance either to post secondary to a job. Um, so these are the courses that we offer here with Selma Adult. These are emergency medical technician, wildland firefighting, certified nursing assistant CNA, um, fire and emergency dispatch. We have a heavy equipment operator, a security guard card with a baton training. And then we are also adding the um, instructional aid with the power professional. So these are all courses where students can come in, get an industry certification in between five, 10 or 18 weeks, get into a job. Um, just gonna go through real quick, and I brought a couple of students because I really want you to hear from the students what the uh, what their experiences and where they are now. Um, I have Alexis Morphine and uh, I have Jocelyn Guzman, and I just want to come on, come on up, and I just want you guys to uh, share uh, for the EMT. Um, Alexis went through the EMT class here in Selma, and she can share real quick what she what she's at and what she's done. Hi, everybody. I'm Alexis Morphine, and I joined the EMT course, I believe. Um, time has gone so fast, I can't even remember if it was September or October. And um, between those months until the end of December, uh, we have met every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday night from 6 to 10 p.m. Um, and we learned about how to be an EMT. I was able to get certified in... Um, first aid and safety. And I am also registered to take my national exam now um, in March. So we, uh, with that course, we are able to apply to take the national registry to actually be EMTs, um, which sounds funny because of course you would think, oh, EMT, but there's a lot of uh, different classes and maybe misinformation out there on how how to get a career or to get a career in this or maybe a private school and that costs a lot of money but what I liked about Valley ROP is that they are very informative about the course to outline what we're going to be doing um, mm -hmm. signing us up for a class making sure that we are um, signing up for a career and to get a career in this field uh, I am actually a Selma High graduate and so it is very nice to not drive that far. I still live in Selma, so I got to only drive five minutes to get to school every night. And so I also wanted to give a big thank you to my instructors, uh, Mr. Mark Zamora and Mr. Donovan Fuller. Fuller. Um, they stayed there with us, um, I mean, until 10 o'clock every single night, and they had their own families and own careers. Uh, Mr. Fuller is actually the chief of the fire department, and he would, after a full day's of work, and a kid at home would still come uh, to be with us. I think that just shows that the people that are in this program, they're really passionate on helping us out, making sure that uh, we're able to find a career. So uh, it's been a pleasure to be a part of the program. Awesome. All right. And next, Jocelyn Guzman, who actually took also the EMT class years ago and then started, uh, took the CNA class here in Selma, and then she can tell you where she's going now. Hi, everyone. Jocelyn, nice to meet you guys. Thank you for having me. So out of high school, I went to Dineva High School. I graduated in 2017. Right out of high school, I took the EMT course with Valley Rom. Um, I always knew I wanted to be in the medical field, so I knew that EMT was a stepping stone to that pathway, so I decided to take the course, and um, for 18 weeks, I got all the experience um, to learn what it as a first responder on a scene and stuff like that. Um, became certified. I was employed with a Lifestar in Tulare. I don't know if you have ever heard of it. It's a private ambulance company that um, assists um the Tulare um, Fire Department. And after um, I decided to continue my schooling in the, the healthcare, so I decided to take the EMT course. I was working on prereqs at Fresno City for my RN when I was doing the e, um, CNA. Um, I decided to get certified in that, and I ended up getting a job here in Rolling Hills, um, in here, right here, down the street in Selma. And um, then that helped me get a position at Fresno Community. I currently work there right now. 
after I was done with the CNA course, um, it was actually another stepping stone for me to join the LVN program. So instead of going straight to the RN, I decided to do the LVN and um, Valley Romp came and they gave us information about Clovis Adult and Fresno Adult. And we did some research um, on the schools and I decided to join and I'm currently in the program and it's going well. And But if it wasn't for Valley Romp, I wouldn't be in this position I am today. And I'm very grateful that I was I had this opportunity. Are there any questions? If and so the goal is to have adults get certified and move forward to to their with their certifications um i have a lot of information about those classes but if you have any questions about uh the other well uh the other courses that we offer let me know thank you very much you're welcome thank you thank you thank for you. being part of our team we appreciate that so I have, I'm going to put someone on the spot just for a couple of minutes. I'm going to ask Desiree Dougal to come up to the microphone, who's who's okay. been a part of the adult school program for a long time. And she teaches full time as a kinder teacher. And then she goes to work in the evening. And I like her to just share why she does that and why what we do or what we were doing in our district is so important. Um. I started, it's I think 28 years ago, started working with um, kindergarten. I started teaching kindergarten over at Garfield Elementary. And then um, I moved on to Terry and then got some information about the adults. I have always been very passionate about the families and the adults here in Selma Unified. There is or in Selma, there is something really, and I don't, I don't even live here. There's something really different about the Selma families. Um, they're very connected. You need something that they come in as a group to help out. And I've just always so much enjoyed being a part of the families. Um, when I first started teaching here, my husband and I used to make home visits to just try to get to know the families a lot more. And I started finding out that we really need to do something more, not just for our kids, but something more for the adults and that they really do want to do more for their families and their children. He are some of the hardest workers I've ever met in my life. And I'm old. I've met a lot of people. They, they have, um, they want to do more for their families. They work two, three jobs, sometimes, you know, 14, 15 hours a day. And the opportunities are not always there. I've mentioned this a few different superintendents were. And I mentioned this, of course, to Dr. Shepard and then to Dr. Wildman. And things just really started moving for adult school. When I talk about um, the enrollment of adult school pre-COVID, I don't ever like to talk about COVID because everybody's going to say, oh, well, it's because of COVID. So pre-COVID, we would always have um, a big enrollment, but the enrollment would not stay for adult school. So enrollment could be 175 people enrolling and going through the process and not always staying. And we would have about 57 people, 57 adults staying with adult school. I'm so excited because we finished out, we had, I think it was about 185 for ESL enrollment. And I left my papers over there, but um, I believe we, we finished with 179 for ESL, ESL. We had 44 graduates last year for adult school. We serviced 104 just in the fall. What's fabulous about with Fabrizio and, and uh, Valley ROP is if we don't have a room right now for them to get their diploma, they don't have to have their diploma just yet. We can get them into a career technical education class. It is so wonderful and so cyclical. And all we're doing is helping the students really, because if our parents are leading by example and showing, and we're showing them how hard this is life, how hard life is. 
and how much work you have to put into it, kids are going to succeed. Well, I'm really excited also because, um, and then here comes Dr. Wildman, who's like, you know, my dream come true when it comes to helping others. She finds money between her and Dr. Shepard, finding stuff, you know, to apply for, to get. We are now going to be able to serve folks, 200 to 250 families, all while teaching the um, transition students life skills. We're going to be able to sign off on those wonderful resumes for them saying they learned accounting, they learned, um, you know, everything, inventory. Um, we're now, we've got Alicia Gonzalez was awesome in getting the, um, the graphics class at the high school involved in this, where now they're going to, we're going to use some recyclable bags for um, the food pantry. We've got Sandy Wagner and um, is it Eduardo with the Avid kids that are going to be helping. And I'm also um, a part of the Selma Greater Kiwanis, which we are the parent company, company for the Key Club. So we're getting the Key Club kids involved. It's such a huge circle. And I'm, I'm so excited about all the things that are happening, all because we're centrally located. People can leave their house, maybe leaving a, an older teenager in charge, but you're not that far away. And we have, we have families and adults that are taking pride in themselves. When they're taking pride in themselves, their kids are gonna see that. So I'm just, I'm very excited. We're, we also have a couple other things happening with um, the American Rescue, I think it's the, American Rescue Funds, we're going to be helping the homeless and foster youth, all because we opened up Washington. And, you know, it, you know, and there's something probably Dr. Shepard wasn't the most popular person in the world for that <laughs> at the time, but it really has opened up. I mean, you got to come to mm -hmm. the school. It's like the fairgrounds are leaving, <laughs> you know, at 730. It's so crowded and people are walking there. Mm -hmm. The weather was horrific a few weeks ago before, before break. They're there. Mm -hmm. They're showing up. And then, you know, if there's not an opening or there's, we've got a wait list, we're over there pushing them over to Valley ROP or read the college. I mean, it's so much bigger than what I think you might know. So come over and take a look. And it's wonderful because now we have um, Rosa Bali, who that's her concentration is just going to be adult school. And I've known her for 18 years. I know that she's going to put her all into this. She's not going to have any other interruptions. It'll just be adult school. So there's going to be a lot of attention paid to that. And if you would have talked to me last week, I was going a little bit crazy with purchasing and getting excited about some things, but I'm going to calm down. <laughs> um, but my husband's on board. He went out and bought a freezer. So we could, we might've got a little bit crazy. And I checked a few free boxes and I think we got about, I think it's 6,800 pounds of meat for free. So, you know, I'm a teacher. If it says free, we're checking those boxes. So, <laughs> um, anyway, it's really exciting. And Rosa and I welcome you to come on down. Um, the evening is when we're popping. So come on and see everything that's happening. It is just phenomenal. And I'm, I'm just so excited that these are the families that um, just need a little extra, just a little helping hand. They're not asking for it forever. They just want a little helping hand. That's it. And we get to do that. And you all are going to be a part of that. So thank you, Desiree. Thank you. What are the times for the evening? The time, the times? When, when do students arrive? Uh, <clears throat> uh, ESL starts at five o'clock from five to seven thirty. We also have two morning classes for ESL and those begin from eight to seven thirty. We have um, then, of course, our adult transition is in the morning. Um, but most of our evening classes for ESL or from, you know, from five to seven 30 
During the daytime, we have one-on-one -on -one for independent study, and we also have independent study for the evenings. Um, I believe, do we have a? All at night. All at, all at, Valley all ROP is all at night. Yeah. Because the most the day, they want to get this certification to move forward and use their night time. So we need the time to do it. And it's just, I mean, I have a, uh, the gal that was just speaking right there, she reminds me of how old I am because I've had every single, but every single one in her family. And I think you said I'm getting somebody. Getting my yeah. <laughs> so, uh, all, so I just, I've known a lot of these over the years and I've had, I've known a lot of these families and now I'm getting their kids. So it's wonderful to teach in kindergarten, make those connections with the adults and then let them know that there's other opportunities that, you know, they can, continue they don't to have learn. to settle. Yeah, they can continue to learn. Yeah, we're just empowering. And that's just a, it's a wonderful thing to be a part of is be able to empower others. So, Thank you. Yeah. yeah, this is great. Um, I do. I want to say thank you. Thank you for thank what you, you guys, for the yeah, thank you for what you guys are doing with not just our children, but their families and our community and, and, and really, and a thank you to the previous board as well yeah, that's the, for having the, the intestinal fortitude to do what you did and keep it up guys. You're doing great. Thank you. I mean, this is make the city proud too. Whoever is listening right now, the cities, if there is adults out there yep. looking for it and they could have enrolled into this and I get a benefits for it and, and the job opportunities like um, these students give it. So this is great, great for the city, and there's nobody left behind it. So thank you. I've always said it takes a village, and I think we put the right people in the right places to uh, ensure that we're all on the same same board, same mm -hmm. ship, same vision. Thank <laughs> you. Forever grateful. Dr. Shepard, you have... Uh, Thank you for coming tonight, everyone that participated. We really appreciate it. So moving on next is the SUSD student internships. So I've asked, um, I met with Superintendent uh, LaFaro and asked him, if you'll recall, but you may not have been on the board yet, so I can never remember, you know, the transition time. But we, <clears throat> we brought six students to present uh, that were involved in uh, internships with some companies, including Harris Construction, and I can't remember the other two. But um, we've been talking internally about doing some paid student internships in the district, like in our various departments. And um, so I met with um, uh, Fabrizio and asked him to bring an I a little proposal to our board here to he's just going to present tonight we'll bring it back for action if you show, so choose but i we really would like to establish and look at a per, uh, program for internships for our high school students um, um hopefully this summer and then throughout the year so i'm going to turn it over to fabrizio thank you again oh hello good evening again um Again, now it's talking about uh, high school internships and really give students work experience with uh, with what they're doing in high school already. So give the students who are interested in moving forward and do some internships. Um, we've already had this partnership actually starting. Uh, we started back in 2017 uh, with students and uh, then with Dr. Shepard, we brought it back uh, last year and it was very successful. Um, and now we would like to expand this program. It's so it's so good that um, really would like to show you what it can do. This is a little bit about value OP. I'm just going to skip a little bit because um, uh, okay. what we do, and this is just information on on how we serve the district, um, all the programs that we have. We work with Dr. Pickle and the students here and um, Mr. Lane at the middle school. But... Um, wanted to focus real quick on um, on the current internships that we have. So right now we have a, a, a partnership with the city of Selma for the firefighting internships that we do and uh, SKF Selma, Kingsburg and Fowler Sanitation District. And those have been going on for a while and students do rotations. Um, things that we would like to propose 
for um, for the new internships, new paid internships will be with uh, the educational pathway, uh, working with some unified teachers, uh, some unified and putting students as teachers aid uh, with the extended learning opportunity program with construction. Uh, besides with Harris construction, but also with Mark Wilson construction um, and having the students do construction management here. So they actually can see what the, they're doing with the new CT building and other programs and projects that they have going on. With business and technology pathway with Selma Unified working with the IT department and also automotive with the automotive uh, pathway and working with the Selma Unified School District, the transportation department, putting students in a work in a work environment there and there's so many other opportunities we, we can have media students from video production or graphic design do logos do things like that and and work with them and uh um uh how it works is is really a, a good way for that we're able to work with the uh with the employers um and and the students so the students are basically um in the pathways they have already been on those pathways for sometimes two or three years and they're recommended by the teachers and then they actually get interviewed. And so once they're interviewed, the employer selects the students that best fit their program. And, and once, they're, once they're, they're selected, they actually become um, employees of Selma Unified School District. And so the, the great thing for that is that the employers don't have the liability and they're placed on their job to do again, work experience and an internship uh, with specific skills that they're going to learn or just just add to to their resume. So well, we're always safe. So I, obviously our firefighting students, they don't go and fight fires. They observe, they do a lot of other things with the fire department. Uh, same thing for SKF and same thing for what we would like to do with the other departments. Does anybody have any questions? So Doug Wrights did agree to do one for Wilson Construction. Yes. As, yep. Who is... Um, they're constructing our career tech ed building and also the DO. So I connected him with Doug. Yeah, so I just met great. with him uh, last week <clears throat> on Monday. Yeah, before the COVID, I used to have my office, get a couple of students from Selma. We done three, four years like that. We're in the engineering, they could learn the CAD uh -huh. and work on a few hours after school. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's really great, the, the exposed to the student, you know? they could get into their uh, career or what they like. Yeah. So we'll be connecting with um, our department heads and see how many are interested in having some. I know, I do know that there's a couple of our directors definitely are interested in having some student internships, so. Yeah, we met uh, with the, the after school program director yes. of the CCs, uh -huh. and uh, she was very excited. She yeah. really would like even to start in the spring semester during the spring break. Yes. If, if, if we can have a chance to get those students during spring break, work with the after school program during that spring break uh, period, yeah. and then come back in the summer and start the summer experience. Awesome. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. You so very we'll be much. working with Fabrizio on finalizing a plan and bring it back from approval by the board. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Next, moving forward, review of a CA dashboard and SUSD differentiated assistance. So I'm asking Dr. Catania to provide you some information about uh, the uh, dashboard, the California D dashboard for uh, educational excellence, and then differentiated in uh, assistance. All right, we'll let the gentleman get the um, PowerPoint um, pulled up there and you had them in your um, board packets. So <gasps> this presentation is about, if you remember, um, the um, smarter balanced um, tests were given in the spring of 2022 and we already received the results for those, which we'll be referencing over in when we do the math report in a minute. But we um, did a presentation um, a few months back in September, October to the board on those results from the SBAC. And I just wanted to say, as we start the this presentation on the, not the math one, the one before, we need the other one, the one on the uh, California dashboard. You don't have it? Yeah, I, I CC'd Mark on it when I sent it to Rose. 
Okay. Problem. I'll get it in a minute. Ro it says, percentages. So maybe talk about the California dashboard. Okay. So it, it would be like super easier if it was displayed. So the California dashboard, um, it is a measurement that California puts together that has not only the academic results of the tests that were given in the spring, but it measures actually um, five local indicators, um, things like uh, one of them is around like the Williams Act. Do you have the correct teachers with credentials, facilities, what are the quality of your facilities, and the correct um, curricular materials. Um, and then it also measures chronic absenteeism, chronic absenteeism, uh, suspensions, both ELA and math, um, as well as, uh, let's see, it's five of them. Uh, we'll get there in a minute. So when the California dashboard came out, which was more recent, and by the way, I think I said this, but in October, we did an hour long workshop for the board prior to a board meeting. So I just wanna offer for those that weren't on the board when we did that workshop, I'm happy to meet with you individually and go over the California dashboard much more slowly. Um, and so that the um, dashboard is meant to not only give you um, in a snapshot picture, picture, so to speak, how your kids are doing academically, but then those other things that are critical to student success, which is chronic absenteeism, um, your student suspension, and how your English learners are doing, graduation rates. So those other things other than just the academic indicators. So California has a support system where if you have three, two or more subgroups that are in the very lowest scoring category on those indicators that they send um, a collaborative team to support you um, on that so that um, you can, and you sit down in our case, it's the County Office of Education, and you sit down with them and you go over what your strategic improvement plan is. And then they will, all right, here we go. So you go over that with them. And then their, um, their role is to um, verify that the improvement plan that your district has implemented to increase your students' uh, academic achievement as well as reduce suspensions, reduce absenteeism, increase grad rates. They make a, they make a, um, a, a decision whether or not that improvement plan is su sufficient to, um, so that your students will progress forward as they should. So as you can imagine here, I'm going to skip forward now to some of this. There again, you, you all have this in your board packets, but it talks about that, the purpose of the dashboard. By the way, this is the front page of the California dashboard when you go to the California Department of Education.gov website and go to the dashboard. So you would put in Selma in Fresno County and it has um, those five indicators I talked about, which will come up in a minute, but it also has things about your student population. So there's our enrollment, we're 87% economically disadvantaged, 30.2% English learners and 0.7%, 7 tenths of 1% um, foster youth. But then it also has, and they call these little squares tiles, by the way. So if you hear somebody talking about the tiles on the California dashboard, as you can see, this shows what are the different measures that they're using this year for all 1,000 school districts in California, what are the measures they're looking at to see who needs some additional support? And um, I'm sure it'll come as no surprise, like if you look at that first tile on chronic absenteeism. So on this one, when it says very high for Selma, these are our tiles. 
when it says very high, that's because we have very high chronic absenteeism. And remember, chronic absenteeism is measured um, student by student for those students who miss 10% or more of instruction in a year. So um, that would be every 20 days, let's say of a month, if a student missed two days, they would be considered chronically absent um, at that point. And then suspension rate. So as you can imagine, um, the idea is to lower our suspension rates uh, by our improvement activities. I think um, the English learner tile there, you can be proud of that because there were many districts that were um, very low with their English learner progress. But if you'll um, remember back in the last two years presentations we've done, um, work really focusing on our English learner students and making sure that all of our teachers are using the um, exact right curriculum and we're monitoring the acquisition of English of those students. And we have the administrators and the program managers all trained in walking through classrooms and making sure that we're seeing the instruction done with the English learner students is most effective. So, um, so we're medium on the English learner, learner progress, which is great. And the grad rate, we're, um, the grad rate, we're medium on that. And remember, this is, um, the grad rate is a four-year measure. It's a four-year average. So our grad rate stayed at medium, even though we had to figure COVID into that. So that's good. The college and career indicators, they're not uh, reporting on that this year. Because of the COVID year, there again, it's a four-year average. And so um, because there were those years during COVID, they are choosing, and the growth rate isn't the same, they're choosing not to report on this year. But then we have the academic areas of English language arts and math that will be going um, ahead of. So this is what I talked about. There are six state indicators, which are these tiles we just looked at and then the five local indicators. Um, and this is, I just said that too, this is basically that last bullet there. The state uses, looks at those indicators to identify LEAs that they feel need support to make sure that there's another entity looking at their improvement plan to make sure that those students are getting the most effective program to help them reduce that chronic absenteeism and reduce suspensions and improve the grad rates and the academic skills for those students. So um, this is there again, this is the local indicators I was talking about. These you are just reported to you as a board once a year locally. And the priority one there, that's the Williams um, lawsuit settlement agreement things, teacher credentialing, instructional materials and facilities. We have number two is how we're implementing those standards. Priority three is parent and family engagement. So we have surveys we send out to the parents and that's a measure of that. Um, the local climate survey, this is where we actually survey the students and we're asking them th such things as, how safe do you feel at school? How safe do you feel um, coming to school and going home from school? Um, you know, how many fights have you witnessed on campus? Those kinds of things. So that's a, a local survey that we do. And then um, access to a broad course of study, making sure that all the required subjects that we are required to teach kids, we're actually um, teaching. So the rating that we get, and I'm gonna skip that, this is the same as, this shows those tiles that we just say, showed. It's a list of them, uh, what were really measured on this year. So there again, it's those same, ones that I just indicated, and I'm getting forward so we can start with this. So for 2022, for this year, so the state looked at those six tiles and they're looking at our subgroups and how did our subgroup do in each one of those state measures of those little tiles. So, and by the way, when I say subgroup, because this question always comes up, a subgroup means at each school and student group, you have to have at least 30 in that category. So like 30 Hispanic kids, 
30 African-American kids, 30 um, Native American students. That's how they determine subgroups. Um, if you have 30 or more, if you only had um, like two um, uh, American Eskimo students, they wouldn't constitute a sub subgroup. And the bottom bullet there for homeless and foster, because those students are under such challenges um, always because the foster, as we know, gets moved around from home to home, homeless, when you don't have a place where you can do your homework at night, where you can keep your computer if you're living in a car or living like three families to an apartment or something. For homeless and foster youth, if you have 15 of those students in your district, they're considered a subgroup because California knows how challenging it is for those students. So when you go to the California dashboard, we're going to look at chronic absenteeism, that first little tile. And it's very easy to do. And like I say, I'm happy to do an individual um, session for each one of you. But if you click on the tile, literally, you put your cursor over there and click, it starts to tell you lots more information. So if we put our cursor on that and clicked, now with chronic absenteeism, you see down below there, it tells you how many subgroups of your students are in each category. So in our case, you can see there, we had eight of our subgroups that were very high for chronic absenteeism, meaning eight of our subgroups were high for chronic absenteeism. And if you think this is for um, the year prior, so it was for um, the, 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 okay, we're in 22-23, 22, so it was for 21-22. And so, we still, if you think about last year, how many COVID outbreaks did we have? And we would tell the kids, if you have symptoms of COVID at the very beginning of the year, stay home. Or And then we evolved to come to school, we'll test you. And so I can tell you that the, of the um, school districts in Fresno County that are kindergarten through high school, every single district had very high chronic absenteeism. Because whether the student is absent for a valid reason, like they had COVID, it doesn't matter. You're still considered chronically absent if you miss the two or more days a month, 10% of the instruction. So that's why we had eight subgroups. So if I had, if we were on our computers and I click on that tile of chronic absenteeism, it shows me who those eight subgroups are right there. So you can see that we have the different subgroups we have in our district are Asian, English learners, foster youth, Hispanic, homeless, socioeconomically disadvantaged, sometimes referred to as our Title I students, our students with disabilities and white. So every subgroup that we had, had a high um, chronic absenteeism rate. And this just shows you if there were some of those subgroups in the other categories of medium, low, or very low, they would show up um, here. So differentiated assistance is then if we have two or more subgroups that get that low rating in any of those um, six tiles, so to speak. And by the way, Selma was in differentiated assistance also in 2018, for those of you that were here in 2018. Um, and that was because of your student with disabilities and your English learners. So for the dashboard that just came out, the district is in differentiated assistance, like I say, like all other K-12 districts in Fresno County. And this shows you our three subgroups were students with disabilities, foster youth and homeless that had two or more areas um, that were very low. So chronic absenteeism, all of them. Suspensions were foster youth and homeless. And then a, a low grad rate was our students with disabilities and then very low academic for ELA and math with, for our students with disabilities. And some of you just to speak about chronic absenteeism once more, and that was kind of the reason for the um, for the big focus on attendance that this year we have to get our kids back in school. And so all the all the efforts that have been made and the programs that have gotten started, 
are we all know that kids can't learn if they're not in school. And so I'm really um, excited to hear, Mr. Lane, that you had a 95 percent um, attendance after we came back. That's that's really great to hear. Um, so just so the board's informed, so on February 6, the county superintendent of schools office and our district um, education services team will sit down and look at the strategic um, education improvement plan, our five-year plan, um, and so that they can um, have a have a um, opinion on whether or not that plan is going to bring about the improvements that we um, hope to see. And I can, just as an aside, since that used to be my job when I was deputy superintendent at Fresno County Office of Education, I'm pretty sure our plan will be good. So, but we'll report back to you on that. Any questions about that California dashboard? I'm sorry it was like kind of drinking from a fire hose, but I'll sit down, like say, at your at your um, convenience and spend an hour with each one of you to go through that if you'd can you, like. Can you put back up the uh, dashboard real quick? Sure. So the tiles. Yeah, just wait. So this handout isn't this part, right? It's no, we're going here. to that next. Okay. We're specifically going to talk about math next. Yeah. All right. So this right here, you're talking about the absenteeism overall. Yeah, our absenteeism and um, our for those absenteeism is our biggest, pro, uh, I guess you'd say problem, one of our biggest hurdles. And then also our suspensions of foster youth and homeless. So we're also looking and addressing that. Uh, and then our students with disabilities, of course, their ELA and math rate. I don't know if any of you caught it was um, a week ago. So it was January I don't know, whatever seven minus 23 is. Um, a week ago, uh, there was an article in the Fresno Bee where Clovis Unified has, and by the way, the chronic absenteeism, that is for all of our students in the district. Whether or not we have uh, students with chronic um, disabilities, chronic diseases, all those kinds of things. And so there was an article a week ago, Clo what Clovis Unified is going to do because all districts are facing this. So what they're going to do is they're going to enroll all of their students that have um, medical issues. So they have to be absent, you know, when they, when their kids like get a cold, if, um, if you're a medically fragile student, even a cold could be life ending for some of those students. And so those students have to stay home and away from others um, as much as possible. So one solution that Clovis came up with is they are going to enroll all their medically fragile students to one school site, but the kids will stay at their home school, but they're going to, and receive their program at their home school, Buchanan, Alta, Sierra, and Garfield, but their registration where they're registered on paper will all be in the Garfield Medically Fragile Program. So it'll take all those kids out of the database at Buchanan High School and Alta Sierra. And my personal opinion is it's too bad that we have to revert to things like that, which is a little bit of um, you know data manipulation, rather than saying, these are our kids, these are the schools they go to, and we just need to look at how we can reduce that chronic absenteeism and maybe, um, you know, go to online and hybrid programs for those kids when they need to be out. We now have, you know, we have the um, home hospital. So if a kid's going to get, be out beyond, is it 10 days or 14 days, Dr. Shepard? Um, 10 days, I think. But yeah. It, it has to be a long-term medical. Yeah, if it's a long-term um, absent they get switched over to um, home hospital and those days do count for them then. So as we we're recovering from COVID, um, it's, it's the things that we absolutely will keep um, an eye on. And we're looking at particularly these three groups to look at how are we really addressing those three groups in particular in having their attendance rates improve, okay? All right, and like I say, I'll go over the, I'll sit with you for the California dashboard because literally you can spend an hour. It's very fascinating all you can find out for your district. Okay, 
So moving on to the next one, is that okay, um, uh, President? Yes. Great, okay. So with the, with the um, starting in the fall, um, Dr. Shepard made a commitment that, and you actually passed board policy, that the board would be continually upgraded, um, updated on the progress of particularly English, the English language arts achievement and math achievement ongoing throughout the year. Because otherwise what was happening across many, many districts um, in the past is once a year, you get the SBAC results and you know they're they're usually not what you had hoped for but then what happens is the board unless you know you change your um, policies to state that the board doesn't get to see what progress is being made throughout the year so that and all of us need that information um, vital information so that we can adjust course look at who which of our students need more focused attention and make sure we're getting additional resources and and um, people to those students. So this is, we presented the math data once in November or September. And so this is your second update of the, um, the math data for our district. So I wanted to remind you um, from the beginning of the year that for, this was the spring test in uh, 2020. So our, our latest state test, which was last spring in 2020, these are the results. Overall, as a district, 20% of the Selma students met or exceeded the standard for math. So that meant we had basically 79% of our students were not being, are not being successful in math. So, and especially when we looked at the language arts, the language arts proficiency is double what math is. So um, as a district, the math is at a critically low point. And so all of our schools and our principals have been focused on uh, improving the math instruction and measuring the students and identifying students who are still struggling with math and getting additional resources to those students. So we're gonna start with the high school. So in grade 11, last spring, when the high school students and um, only 11th graders take the math test in high school, by the way, needless to say, every grade level, 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th, those teachers give their kids math tests, but the only state test that's given is to our 11th graders. And you can see here that only 11.81% uh, of our students were proficient in math, which um, needless to say, we, we have a lot of room for our improvement. So we saw in November um, the start of improvement. And so here's our latest update. And um, Dr. Pickle can provide more information. I tried to condense this into one chart and not go, um, you know, too lengthy or too in depth. But these are what you see on the column that is the right. These are the different math courses offered at the high school. And um, we can bring it back again in the November meeting. We had a flow chart and Dr. Pickle talked about why students are placed in these various classes. And we're looking at accelerating the learning of those that were very, very far behind to get them caught up to um, where they need to be in the, in the math curriculum. So as we look here, you can see that the number of students is the next column. And then we have for the Jan their January testing round, the percent of students in each course that exceeded, met or exceeded, the um, the standards for that course. So if you keep in mind that only 11% were proficient last spring, and granted this is a period of time from November through the first part of January, but as you can see there, in all courses we're well above 11%. And so, um, and Dr. Pickle has it further broken down 
by teacher and by students so that all of our math teachers are looking at which of their students were below 80% on their test and focusing additional instructional time, small group instruction, and those things with the students. And then we also looked at the change percent column there. What we looked at is between last November and the January um, uh, update, it, course by course, the red is we decrease the number of students that are performing at the 80% or above. If you think about test scores, you know, 80% is a B or above. What percentage of the kids are getting Bs or higher, so to speak? And um, green is the amount of students in that course are increasing the number of students above. So you can see the ones that I highlighted in yellow under the course name, those are the courses you can see there where the decrease in the number of students that are performing at level B or above, the number had decreased more significantly than 10 10 percent because you're always going to have some variation so and the idea about the identification at this level is so then that um, dr pickle and his administrative team meets with the teachers of those courses and you can see under the percent not met we specifically said the number of students so on that top row so the 47 students who were well below um meeting the standards for that course. For those 47 students, what, are, what additional resources are we doing to help those students? Because basically those students are on track for an F right now. And so that's the level that we have to get to to help those students right away. And, you know, maybe they were on home hospital or something, but um, whatever it is, we have to look student by student and see what can we do to help those students. So you can see overall, again, by the exceeding or met column, we're well on track this year for many more of our students to be significantly on the state test to do significantly better. But we're still concerned about each and every student in the not met column as well, and they're addressing that. I see our student board member shaking his head. Do you have any further comment on that? What you hear from students and what you see? I um, I know from experience that that test was exceptionally hard. Um, it's it's very hard when you're in this math math one, math two, math three um, sort of system to catch up when you are, fall behind. Mm -hmm. So providing resources to help these students progress further. Um, whether that be after school time, before school time would be very beneficial because I know personally, once I don't grasp a concept and my teacher moves on, it's very hard to catch back up. That test was really hard. And I know a lot of people around me said that, as you could see by the numbers, it wasn't easy whatsoever. So you're only going to see those students who I marked it on the, um, I mean, on mine, uh, algebra down. Uh, those are for people who don't exceed in math. So obviously that it, that's already going to put them behind and the failing rate in math one. I know a lot of people who have repeated it as a junior. So there are these large subsets of students who are not like not being helped whatsoever. It feels as they're being like left behind. So I just, I want the board to know that resources need to be provided. Math is a very um, struggling subject across all of Selma High. So, okay. yeah. and we know that math uh, largely is you'll hear many, many people say math, your, your success in math is a gateway to college, to doing well in college. So that's why, in fact, we had when um, Dr. Pickle and I came and Dr. Shepard, we had students that, as you said, they would take math one as a freshman, they'd fail. They'd get put back in math one as a sophomore, they'd fail. And they'd get put back in math one as a junior. And it's like, that can't be. You can't do that and not provide additional resources. So that's why one of the purposes of the Common Core class was to, for this year, to take 136 of those students and 
provide additional intensive support for um, those standards that they need to master. And then hopefully, then they will catch back up. But there's, as you can see in that common core class, there's 47 of them that are still struggling that we're looking very intensely and um, will be encouraging not only after school, but we want those students in summer school as well, because they have to have time to catch up. Um, I also wanted to say here at Selma High, it feels very optional for math to be a subject for you to take because you're only required two years of math and only you have to pass math one to graduate and um, any of those um, other maths um, algebra and um, below they are you need to pass one and then you pass math one which I think isn't beneficial for these students to say hey you could fail you don't have to move on to math two math three it's it needs to be pushed on these students more because I remember as a sophomore people already moving past math are fine with failing it because they're like oh I could take applied math next year and still graduate it is very harmful to these students that you as a district are allowing them to not or sorry that they feel it's very optional to have math and that isn't beneficial whatsoever so thank you and and i think it it was too easy to say oh but math one or math two is so hard so lots of kids are failing it and that's why Common Core and Algebra were created because no, those are the classes that are at your level to help you. So if you're still failing in those classes, then we've got to really investigate and see what's going on with those. And just as a, also trying to help the advanced kids side, um, Math 3 is equivalent to Community College Math 45. And in fact, in our endeavor to increase the number of college concurrent enrollment and dual enrollment courses next year will be offering for students either in math three honors or the students that have proven they can do well they'll be able to take um, concurrently math 45 and get college credit for their math um, in the math three class so we're providing that as well so we continue to really look at the students and provide all the resources we can, including additional sessions um, to help these students. Now, moving on to eighth and seventh grade, here's part of the problem of our, why the high school struggles with math, right? Is so we knew that the seventh and eighth grade, these were their, their test scores coming into the year. So if you've on the eighth graders, if you've only got 16% of your kids coming into Selma High School that are the level they need to be in math, it's no wonder so many were failing math one. So there again, we changed the uh, curriculum last year. If you remember, we went to illustrative math and it's got a software uh, platform called Desmos. And so let me move ahead here. So here is our update on our seventh graders. And you can see we have four teachers that are teaching um, at the seventh grade level. And so we are encouraged, but still working because we have 61% of our students that on their January testing were at 80% or higher on their tests. So we know that we are at the middle school level they're increasing their performance. And I always say we're encouraged, but we're still focused on the students that are in that 50 to 59% column and why those students are still failing in January uh, on their test on integers and giving them additional support and time. Um, next is the eighth grade. And so there, now these, Eighth grade students, I'll tell you why this is even more encouraging. We aren't there yet, but this is more encouraging because these eighth grade students last year had the new curriculum. They had Desmos and illustrative math. So you can see they're at 82% that have 80% uh, or higher. So it's really looking encouraging that, um, and by the way, this year we have all the sixth grade teacher, uh, the sixth grade students 
in that same curriculum now, the illustrative math with Desmos. So we can um, back it up even further to get these kids. If we can get them higher each grade level coming in, then we can push them on to um, where they need to be. While still, you know, I always look at the 59 to 50% column and go, okay, so we have, you know, 22 and seven. So what's that? 29, 30, 31 and five. So we have, oh, it's right there, 36. So there's still 36 students in the eighth grade that are really struggling. So we're still talking with their teachers and focusing on what's going on with those kids. And then when we go to the more um, elementary levels, so this gives you an idea, what were their test results last spring? So you can see we have everywhere from fifth grade was 16%, and then we had um, fourth grade, third grade, sixth grade. So we're really looking at um, how they're coming along. So I'm sorry, this is kind of a busy chart, but I didn't want to have pages and pages and pages of slide. If anybody wants to see it more broken down by school, we have that. In fact, our jobs, as we're really looking at the math mastery improvement with our uh, uh, PLC improvement model, we do look at all of us that are working on this. We're looking at um, every classroom, at every school, and looking at where are those students that need more support. So you can see there where that blue arrow is, uh, as opposed to these, this level of students meeting proficiency, you can see here we have by grade level, um, starting with kindergarten there, we have 81, 80, 64, 59, 40, 53, and 43. Is that right? Yeah. So um, if you remember last, last in, um, uh, I think it was September, uh, grade three was far and above, ha had more struggling students than any grade level. So it seems like we're doing a little bit better with grade three now, but now you can see grade four um, is of great concern to us um, as well. So, and, you know, every unit, the material becomes, it's more new concepts that the students haven't seen yet. So, and especially when we're into um, division and fractions in grades three and four, it becomes more difficult for student, but that means we need to get more resources, manipulatives, additional time. Um, we hear from the students that student engagement, the students keeping their mind on task because it's hard cognitively, right? If you're looking at something and you don't know quite how to do it, your brain just wants to switch off. So how do we make those kids persist and learn that? We call it student engagement. So we're looking at what additional training can we bring in for the teachers so that they can learn um, additional strategies to keep kids in engaged and be willing to persist even when the learning's hard. And so these are the, um, the areas and the focus groups where we continue to work. But we're, we're also encouraged by um, the uptrend in these figures as well. And um, we conclude that the math, master, the math mastery project, you approved the contracts for um, writing the curriculum. They are taking the Go Math publisher curriculum, but breaking it down into very small step-by-step -step instruction for the students to make it more understandable for them. So we can see here that that is working and we need to take another look at fourth grade. How can we break it down even further for students? So that is our math update and we'll be back next month with ELA. Questions? Um, I heard of you, you know, the 79%, you know, it's fall feeling basically math in the high school level and well as the seventh and eighth grades. So either, I know we changed the curriculum last year, either it's not working out or maybe we should wait till the end of the year, look at it, or maybe maybe it's a teacher's not, a, um, change the method. They, they probably need to do the teaching to change the method or something, or maybe giving out more homeworks. 
And I remember when I was in high school, I get a lot of homeworks in the math and which I will spend some time with the parents or the elders to sit down and do that. And, and um, so I don't know what's why we are. We need to look into it. We need to look into very deeply. This is very sad that um, I don't know. I mean, once they get into college, what they're going to do? I mean, the college is so hard and we could let them pass here, let them graduate. Once they go to college, they're not going to survive. They're going to they're going to go out. I mean, if you don't have math, right. you don't have, you know, English languages, arts. And those are the two things that, so we need to be uh, work on it very deeply. In my opinion, that's my, as been as a board member, I think this is the one of them that we always wanted a achievements of the students. And without this, you guys that we weren't able to achieve it. You guys, teachers, uh, everybody needs to be work together to make this better. I don't want to see 20, 18%, you know, next year. I hope we could go up at least twice you know, either change that, who teachers doing it better, maybe look their method. Maybe they're doing better that. And maybe I, my kids, my my son, he's in the ninth grade. And he, he the math questions that he get, uh, the way that some of those they're teaching out there is a totally different method. I wouldn't teach them that way. I have a minor in math. And uh, maybe the, they need to look into it. That too is not only... The you guys have a nice curriculum, but how about the teaching method? You know, mm -hmm. that needs to be looked into it too, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. But and we're, we're asking those exact questions of the teachers, of those students, <laughs> is because the teachers are the experts in the room. And interestingly enough, um, across the district, there's always teachers that have um, almost 100% of their kids are achieving on these tests. So one thing we're doing is getting those teachers together with other teachers for whatever reason saying, well, how did you teach that? How did you teach that with the kids where you got, and that's not saying there's bad teachers and good teachers. There's just saying there's different ways, as you said, there's different ways to explain things. So, you know, in our teacher's toolbox, it would be great for them to have two or three ways to explain it. And so maybe this teacher has a way that like kids are getting it more. And so, but we do hear from the teachers across the board, kids check out in their brains. We can see it in their eyes. We have to, we need to, to have more engagement strategies, um, especially coming back from COVID. At least this is our second year back from COVID. Last year was horrible. You know, kids weren't even used to being back in school yet. So put something hard in front of them and it was really challenging. Yeah, and maybe the method of scoring, instead of giving quizzes 70%, maybe the 50% might be the homework. Let's see, give them progress. And we wanted economic, you know, their brain needs to be built up. On yes. And not only the testing on it, like uh, he said, um, you know, the testing is very hard. Maybe the teachers needs to look into the having them, giving them the more homework, getting them. If the student try it, when I was at the, my class calculus. If I try that answering the questions, I get 50% credit or 75%. At least I'm trying it, even though I get the wrong answer. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe look into that strategy. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Any other questions? I have a question. If yes. the students aren't getting it, if they're just not grasping it, and we're already at the end of the year, is are those students being pushed to the next grade, the next grade? So by the time they get to the high school, they're ready. They're ready. Behind. Do you want to speak to that, Mr. Lane, for the middle school? What are you doing with those students that are still in that 50 percent category? You know, I, I went and I toured one of the classes. I don't remember who the teacher was, but they she was fabulous. I, I went to the Abraham Lincoln last year, the year before, and they the kids were talking about how fast the water was moving per cubic square. I didn't even know what they were talking about. But she made it so engaging that the kids were actually raising their hands. Like, I know, I know, I know. That's what we need. You know, like they, the teachers have to make it. Um, and I think the way she did it was because she was relatable to them. And she talked in their language. And, you know, I think we have to think out of the box. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like, um, oh, one of the words, if you want to get killed in my house, is say, just chill, mom. 
And I'm like, oh, no, you didn't tell me to chill. But that's <laughs> their, that's their, you know, or my son would say, oh, hey, bro, I'm not your brother. So don't even, but that's, you have to be relatable to them. Mm -hmm. And it's not when we went to school where we were very, I'm not saying we're not um, respect, you know, like, yeah. There's a line where you cross, mm -hmm. but this teacher was very engaging and she had them like it was exciting to them and they learned it where you has a you have a teacher who's not relatable. And I don't say you have to use the words that they use nowadays, but you just have to be relatable. You have to, you know, maybe you don't know how to, you know, and I shared this story about my daughter, like she was not getting math. So we we did it like, hey, let's sing a song. So I sang a song with her blah, 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 blah. I didn't even know what I was talking about. But by the time she got <laughs> to her class, she remembered that song. And yeah. so she's like, one plus one is two, you know, and we just did that. And it really helped her. But the teacher wasn't engaging her. It's when she came home and we said, hey, let's sing a song, a rhyming song or this, you know. And, and I think that's the way some of the teachers have to approach the kids nowadays. And, you know, and to continue to push the kids like, like if I don't grasp it, but okay, now I'm going to fourth grade. I didn't grasp it. Okay, now I'm going to fifth grade. I'm still in the fourth grade and you keep pushing me up, pushing me up. So then when you get to high school, Dr. Pickle has all this, like, what do I do now? Adam, would you like to speak to that? Because I saw you nodding your head. <laughs> So I'd like to say I was in the Selma school district from kindergarten to sixth grade and then middle school I left and I came back for high school. The most fundamental years of my learning were, of course, elementary school. And some of like my most skills that I use now came from those engaging teachers that who I still respect to this day because they taught me those fundamental math lessons that I need now in my statistics class. And when I'm able to connect with the teacher or learn because of their teaching style, the way they communicate with me, I was able to grasp their learning. And I know other teachers like that I've had in high school. I completely clocked out of their class because of the way that they taught me, the way they communicated. I didn't feel as though their teaching methods would benefit me in any way they wouldn't help with homework or they just sort of avoided those sort of lessons. Even now I'm dealing with some of those same issues. So it comes down to, I'm not saying blame the teachers, but observe the teachers, see what, what you need to comment on about their style. I've had a few teachers in high school who have greatly helped me are greatly like, I don't know how to say Put me at a disadvantage as as far as my math skills go i could accredit a few teachers to helping me with those fundamental math issues i was in visalia where i took math one as an eighth grader and i took seventh and eighth grade math accelerated in one year to take math one and i was very rushed through that process and i got b's and c's but i was still allowed to move on and when i came here i took math one again to get a higher grade I didn't get that much of a higher grade. I kept B's, but it was that teacher who helped me gra like grasp those skills to feel comfortable in math two and then math three and now statistics. So I great. There's just, please look into these teachers because hear out to the kids because it's not always their, their uh, learning. It's about how the teachers are teaching. Are, are we asking the students are we asking this not just asking the teachers what you're doing to get your scores up are we asking yeah. the students hey what did you what did you get most from this teacher or how how did they help you or is it going to come and talk i did ask a student who graduated from Sama high and i'm like hey how'd you like it he was, it was the most boring experience of my life and i said what is those teachers need to interact with us and they need to make it interesting and as soon as I got into my classes I was like whatever I just got to get out of here I didn't I, it made me sad to hear that so to answer your question directly um, and you weren't on the board yet but we do a climate survey at ALMS and we'll be doing another one in the spring and we ask very specific questions of the kids at, at, of the, oh yeah these are all the kids oh, cool. and how connected they feel to the school and is there an adult you can trust and 
I, I remember um, a number of the statistics, but but one that really jumped out at me was over 90% of the kids said, I believe my teacher expects the best from me. It was over 90%. I, we have an ALMS teacher here, Mr. Braun, this evening, who we're talking about this passion and engagement. I invite you to come over to ALMS and go into his room and, and just see the, the time and effort he spent to make it a very engaging and inviting environment. And, and we have a, a middle school full of teachers who are really engaging and that really care about the kids and uh, I won't I won't belabor the point, but something else that's noteworthy is the commitment to mental health that the district has made with social workers and counselors and clinicians has been huge because some of these issues that our kids are dealing with and that we can speak to as adults, when you're dealing with those, you can't focus with what's going on in class. And this has really helped. It's, it's helped with the counseling and the connectivity. And, and um, the one other thing, and I talked to Dr. Shepard about this, we've had a great reduction in a lot of the discipline issues at ALMS. And I think there are a few reasons for that. But two, two of the biggest reasons as well as the PBI aids that the board, previous board approved, where we have two eight-hour aids, positive behavior, instructional aids, and their whole job is to connect with these kids and, and they're intervening right off the bat with minor infractions. We catch it before they get too escalated. So I think there's a number of things the district have, have put into place that have really helped us um, along this uh, journey that we're on together. I think we do have, we, Abraham Lincoln does have excellent teachers. Mm -hmm. They're engaging. I mean, I think it's a history teacher when you barely walk into the gate by the office. And I say it all the time because I visit his class. And he gives out free books and he mm -hmm. plants his own garden outside his office. But when I walked in there, I was like, oh, I want to come to his class. It was very engaging, very hands on. Mm -hmm. And when I went the next time for the open house, I couldn't even get in. It was, there was a line out the door just to get in there. That's the kind of teachers that, that you remember for the rest of your life because he was engaging, he was exciting. He was like, oh, I want to learn. I mean, these kids were dying to get in there and that's what we need. But we can't keep pushing them to the next grade if they still haven't grasped what they have there. So one of the things that um, in these conversations at the professional learning communities and the principals share, and when they go in the observations, we talk with our principals as well as, I'll go, I want to make mention again of what Dr. Catania mentioned about engagement strategies, and that is something that we are going to focus on on our pre-service days of helping and working with teachers and giving them some strategies to engage students more. That's going to be real focus for the, even though I'm not going to be here, we're planning it now because if you don't get things lined up, it won't be ready, but that is something that we're really looking at. We'll be connecting with teachers on their thoughts about that as well over the next few weeks so so i just wanted to speak about um we also have the climate survey we uh, issued that to students in the springtime we did that last spring we'll be doing it again this spring ask those exact questions um but also uh president alanis uh what you're stating with um putting students in the same class over and over again and trying to and expecting a different result. Um, that is our definition of insanity. Yeah. Um, we have got to engineer um, classes and placements that best serve that student yeah. um, at the level. We have to meet them at their level and bring them up. Yeah. Um, if we're putting a student in math one and then they're failing, we're turning them right back in and put them in math one um, and expecting the teacher to be able to diversify that instruction with that tier two instruction, when you have you know, a class of 32 and 15 students are on task moving forward, well, you have you know, 17 students um, and we all know the 80-20 rule, right? That 80% uh, of your students have it, you need to move on. Well, you know, when you have that type of a balance, you're having to leave behind 17 kids and that's not acceptable either. And so we have to do better with our tier two instruction, which is some of the things we're, we're looking at um, with the program, the online program that you've approved with the CELUS mm -hmm. to be able to do that tier two intervention during class um, with, while the students are moving into groups. Um, and we're going to be working with the math department to roll that out in the springtime. Um, but then we have the other placements for students um, because we do have a graduation requirement of Algebra 1. It's a state requirement. And uh, if a student does not pass Math 1, they will not graduate from high school. However, they may meet 
all of their other requirements. And it's a, it would be a, a tragedy to have a student not graduate from high school because they haven't met that algebra one requirement. So we uh, got together with the math, math department and figured out a way that we can put those students in actually algebra one and move them forward so they can meet that graduation requirement after they've attempted to move through our one, two, three program if they are eligible to, to do so. Uh, many times we get students from the middle school and that's why we started Common Core. Um, those students were not at the level to be placed in one. And if we place them in one, we'd be placing them there um, at, as a detriment to that student because it's way above their head. So we placed them in Common Core and their sequence would be Common Core one, two. Um, and then in their senior, they would have the opportunity to do three. Um, but then with the math test, with that math test written at the math three level, that student's never going to be exposed to that math three level. And so um, we're doing ourselves a disservice because that student is not at grade level to meet that junior test in math three. Um, so we're, we're kind of, a, you know, walking a tightrope. We, do we meet the students and give them the math instruction, which they will be successful and meet them at their level and try to build them? Or do we drop them in the middle of a one, two, three program and hope that they can glean something to prepare for a test? Um, I think we all know the answer, right? Meet the student at where they're at and hopefully we can accelerate that learning with proper intervention so we can get them to math three level and get them prepared for that state test. But we're, we're doing everything we can. And I know that our teachers at the high school, um, they wring their hands about those scores and they are they are struggling every day to reach those students. Um, and I know that um, as Adam says, there are some teachers that, um, that students connect with and some that don't. But I know that every one of our teachers uh, at the high school in the math department care about those students and they really, really are worried about those math scores and really want those kids to succeed. I have a comment though um, is, um, um... President Dalanis had mentioned earlier, it takes a village. It's just not the teachers. It takes the administration. It takes parents. It takes everybody working together to help these students succeed. So, um, and I'm happy that you're going to be putting in some strategies or whatever to help uh, with teaching, teaching students better or whatever, or connecting with them. Um, and so that makes me happy that it does take more than just one group of people. Absolutely. And it's wonderful that um, in our adult school that we could have these programs that may be exposing the parents to math concepts, because what we have is an education level where our students leave the classroom and they go home and there's not that support that Mr. Soda talked about with his extended family uh, providing that help in math. Um, I, I, I'm not a mathematician myself. I have a high school student. He comes home and ask for help with that math. I'm looking at that going, well, now <laughs> let me call somebody. I got to phone in some support here. Um, but we do have uh, that tutoring support online. We, we have, uh, have that program uh, because that support is not available with our parent community. Right. Um, and so um, when the students go home, they're on their own many times and that, that the struggle is real. And so um, we really, really have to, uh, I've often said, if it's important to us, we'll put it in the school day. And so we have to find a way to get that tier two instruction and build those skills yeah. in the uh, in the classroom. Okay, so I got a couple of questions <clears throat> and a comment. Uh, I'll go with the comments first because everyone's kind of set their piece and I'll say mine. A uh, little backstory. When I was in high school, I failed algebra a few times, but I was one of my best teachers, one of my favorite teachers. Because there's one thing he said that I kept in my mind ever since then. And that is, it's better to know how to solve a problem five different ways than to know how to solve a problem just one way. And why this is important. Education, from as I understand it, requires a few things. You have to have a person willing to take a resource, something that you're teaching, a book, and relay it to somebody in a way that they can understand it. You have to have somebody who's willing to listen, to learn, and to ask questions so they can understand. Then you have to have a challenge and you have to have a goal. If you have those four things, you can teach somebody to do anything. I know this because when I was in high school, my grade point average sucked big time. But yeah, I learned. 
when I went to college, I had one professor who used to work with Einstein for trigonometry. Brilliant guy. Sat there, everything went over my head. Glazed over, clocked out, wondering why I was spending my money there because I was going to college and like, well, I can't get this. Flunked the class. Went to another college and took trig again. This time I have a farmer. Guy was a math historian. Took the time to explain it. Mm -hmm. The only difference between the material that was being taught was the person teaching it and me asking questions. The first time I didn't ask questions, I just sat there. You know, I should, I, should, I should be able to understand this guy. He's worked with Einstein. Why am I going to question him? The other guy asked us to ask questions. Why? Why is it this? Why is it that? Why is there a radio? Why, is, why, why, why? And he took the time to teach us. And I learned it. The key point is this. The numbers we're seeing here, as I'm reading them, kind of a little confused with them, looks like we're doing a little bit better, which is good. The worry that we all have is the kids aren't getting anywhere. Maybe they're not being challenged, but more importantly, maybe there's a disconnect in how to relate to the kids that information that can be understood. And more importantly, maybe the teachers don't hear from the students like, hey, I need the help. Because I know a lot of times whenever you have a hierarchy and a teaching environment is a hierarchy, teachers in charge, students are over here, they're supposed to learn. Sometimes it's kind of for the sake of time. Hey, don't ask questions, just go with it. And you can't have that if you want to learn. If you want these kids to advance in the real world, they got to be willing to ask questions, even when people don't want them to. That's the only way to learn. And that sometimes seems like it's not there when I look at things that go on when my kids were going to school. Why is it that way? Well, I don't know that you're supposed to do it. That's not an answer. You got to ask. You need to comprehend. Because comprehension is the key to intelligence and the key to enlightenment and the key to education. And you can't have comprehension without questioning. Just my two cents. And just a final comment. I think these um, scores you see are update today. Kids are doing much better at all grade levels. But we know that's mile marker one of the 10 miles we have to go. So yes, we do fully expect to see much better results this coming year. But we know as we have these programs stay in place and we stay the course with the new um, curriculum that they have been using, that the teachers have been telling us uh, the kids are doing better with that, but we need more engagement strategies. Well, that'll be then we'll get mile marker two and mile marker three um, as we continue to go down the road. So we're very encouraged by these, but knowing it's the start of a long journey. And we won't be, we won't be there until we have all of our kids um, successful. So thank you for um, your time and taking a look at these and we'll continue to report to you. Thank you, okay. Kitty. I already forgot where I was. Number oh, six, adopt the board uh, policy. Okay, number six, adopt revised board policy administrative regulation 5141.21. Administrating, uh, administer, administering, I can't even say it. Administering. <laughs> administering medication and monitoring health conditions. So we brought this um, board policy to you last board meeting. So what I have asked our team is to break out the two issues that were contained in the board policy that were new. One is um, the medication uh, administering Narcan in the, in the need of when needed. And then the other one was the administration and the implementation of a plan for any, any student that has a doctor's prescription for medicinal cannabis. So you separate, separated them out because based on the conversation and input from board members, thought we are just, we totally want to get the, the, I believe they both should be passed, but to give you an option, we'll separate. 
But before we uh, um, do that, I'd like to thank and acknowledge our three school nurses that are here in attendance tonight. Corey, April, and Jordan, if you would stand up and give a wave. These folks are very passionate about the work that they do and um, have uh, had a lot of input and conversation about these two issues. So we're gonna ask that you uh, take action separately on the two issues and let's move forward. So the first one up is uh, 514121A which would allow the district as set forth in the policy and described to administer Narcan in the case of an uh, emergency. And it shows there was last week, the training, where it's gonna be stored, so on and so forth. So any questions about it that um, I'll have our team come up if they have any, if you have any questions, you can ask our nurses and Mrs. Weems. I think personally, um oh, i'm sorry can i say of course um norcan sh I, I don't know if you administer the norcan and somebody doesn't need it is i was told it's not going to have any correct. detrimental um issues but norcan should be all over the campus available to anybody who needs it in emergency purposes just everybody get trained it's it's needed yes well, I, I have to say that I think it's needed, but I don't think it should be all over the campus. I think, well, you yeah. know what? If you if they lock it up in the office and you're like, hang on, let me run to the office, get the key, unlock it, well, you're going to be gone. You want to address that, folks? Yes. Uh, so Narcan is an emergency use drug used to reverse the effects of opiate use. Um, it's an opiate antagonistic uh, class. Um, and yeah, in the county, the public health, they want to get it in as many hands as possible. Yes. Um, try to treat it more as like a, how we do with AEDs now. Mm -hmm. Now it's a yeah. first line of uh, emergency use. You're still going to call 911. You're still going to do that stuff. But it's a short-term thing that can save lives. Yep. Um, and yes, you can give it to someone. It won't have any effect if they aren't on opiates. It doesn't affect them at all. Um, so there's not a reason why you wouldn't use it if you suspect someone with an opiate overdose. Do you know if um, if someone unfortunately has to use that? Is there a, like a time limit, or does it just depends on the person? I mean, the if, if you have to use it, you you take in whatever. The, what is what is that? Uh, I mean, the quicker you can get it to the patient or student, the better. Um, yeah. Anything additional? Is there like a time frame? Do you have to give it to them within fifteen minutes? Well, no, you want to give it to them as soon as you can. As soon as you know that they're, they've are they overdosed, you want to administer the medication as soon as possible. Or believe they've overdosed, right. yes. And this type of medicine, we're giving it to students that if we suspect an opiate overdose, it's they're going to be stopping breathing. Mm -hmm. um, they're going to have a loss of consciousness. So it's an emergency situation that you'd be using it in. So 15 minutes might be too long. Yeah. I was well, told well, it was like two minutes or something. You have to give them within two minutes. You just try to administer as soon as you can. Yeah. As far as the availability throughout the campuses, I'm going to lean on our health team to talk about that in the future. But right now, we would just like to be able to administer it. Would you like a motion? Mm -hmm. I'll make a motion. I'll second. I'll make a motion. One second. Oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry, bro. <laughs> yeah. It's bruh. Sorry, bruh. Well, that even sounds good. Okay, do I have a motion to a motion. approve um, uh, yeah. Regulation 5141A, Norcan? It uh, is. I second that. Okay, Roger uh, made a motion to approve it. We have a Roger second. Roger. I mean, Roger. Wow. Roger who? Joe made a motion to approve, and Estea seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. No. Opposed? One, one, no. one. Okay. Okay, the second um, board policy is 514121B. This is the administration of um, medicinal cannabis for those students who have a um, doctor's prescription. I do not see this as a wide reaching issue. However, there may be those instances when it does help a student, particularly some students with severe disabilities. 
Um, so we've separated it out. It's a separate motion. And you have any questions for our health providers here? Oh, well, I got questions. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I read it. And should I brought it with me? Actually, no, it's in the back somewhere. Um, according to what I was reading, it says that the school staff is not allowed to give them and is not allowed to administer the drug. And the idea is that it allows a parent of mm -hmm. said student to come in and administer right. that drug. There's a few things I, I, I wonder about with that. The first is, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, cannabis is considered a controlled substance, much like Adderall, much like Ritalin. And as I understand that if a parent has Adderall or Ritalin, they're supposed to turn that into the office so that the nurses can administer it. If that's the case, why is there this change in policy? Why it's only we... for cannabis, and Mr. Medina, we discussed it yeah. at length. It's because it's a different type of narcotic. So yeah, but I've talked. We to... can sit here and debate yeah, it I... all night. If you don't want it, just vote no. Because you know, well, I'm sorry I... to be rude, but we've spent hours on this, and to me, um, it's an opportunity for, if a parent chooses to take time out of their day and come and give it to their child that they chose to then that's their right. Um, and I would not want to well, I mean, I'm, have as parent not be able to do that if in fact they found that to be helpful for their child. Well, so, here's here's my take on it is that the reason why this, this bothers me, okay. aside from the idea that it, it's a difference in policy, is that essentially what you're saying is that a parent who has a child that needs Adderall can go to the nurse and the nurse will handle it. They can go about their day. They can go to work. They can take care of their life. But you're telling a parent who has a kid who has to have medical cannabis that no, you have to now take time out of your day to come and take care of your kid. Right. Because the district doesn't want to touch it. No, that's a state law. No, that was, so we're not going to yeah. go against state law. Okay. So that's the way it is in law. But the law doesn't make any sense. Well, you know, you can talk to somebody else about that. <laughs> but right now we're trying to figure out what to do in our district. So. Yeah, I mean, we can sit here and debate it longer as we've already done, Mr. Medina. It just sounds like a hot potato to me in the sense so of- So you can vote according. Yeah. It's, is I would it just state like law? Say, what about federal? That yeah, that's some a good of question. It, it's, it's new for use, right? And they're just looking at using it in the school system and the regulations are not in place yet to implement it in the school system where it is in place to have it for use at home. Um, the parents are trained, they know how to use it, and it's not been implemented in the school systems yet. I have no doubt that it'll eventually get there and it will come that way when all of the regulations and the policies are in place in the state of California. Um, it is a good tool for parents who need it. Um, if you see children who have intractable seizures, and this is one of the only methods to treat it, um, it's an excellent tool for those parents who need to use it. Um, and it keeps our licenses safe while the policies are getting in place and allows the parents to have an option if they need it. Thank you, April. I'm, I'm a plumber. You guys are the medical professionals. What do, what say you? Yes, you all, you. I mean, if I had a child who had seizures or some type of um, arthritis or something where okay. medicine didn't treat what they had and that was an option for them, of course I would. Okay, so you're all... You're all three nodding your head, so I'll make a motion. Let me, let me, before you do that, let me ask it this way. Same question. If the child was having a problem and they needed the medication and we had it, knowing full well that way it's set up, would you give it to the child to save their life? None of these meds would be for saving a life. It, it would change a, a circumstance. It's not considered a life-saving medication. Mm -hmm. It is one to... Um, Oh, I, comfort. Yeah, because I'm just a little, like I said, it sounds like the state wants us to do it, but they want us to keep our hands off it because they're afraid of the money. They're afraid of if we violate federal law, that somehow it's a gray area. And it, and it kind of sounds like a gray area. At least it does to me. So I'm like, if we're going to do it, then we do it all the way. We do it the same way we handle any other controlled substance. Why we're not able we to that? do that at that time. At we this can't. time, we're not able to then do that. Why do it? We still have then to you can vote accordingly. Yeah. 
And part of it too, I think, is they're trying to continue the care that they've already established at home. Right. Between the doctor and the parents right. and the child. The consistency. Because it's prescribed, right? It's yes. something right. that's it prescribed. Is prescription, yeah. Okay. Does anybody have any other questions? Concerns? Do I have a motion to approve um, policy one five one four one two one? B. Oh. B. B. I'll make a motion. Rod. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, He's talking about him. Hey, bro. Me. Thinking about him. <laughs> He's talking about me. Uh, Joel made a motion to approve. Do I have a second? I'll second it. A stay. <laughs> a stay. I made a second. All in favor? Aye. No. All that, opposed? No. Okay. okay. Motion passed. Thank, Thank you. you for being here tonight. Uh, moving forward, um, number eight, review and consider new board schedule of meeting. So at the board's request, we've um, discussed uh, among us uh, to uh, change the board meeting dates to Tuesday. Um, and as a result of the conversations that I've had with each one of you uh, proposals on the table this evening to move um, the date, the board meeting date to Tuesday and the schedule is included for action. Do, uh, does anybody have any questions? Do I have a, a motion to approve um, the new board schedule? Make a motion to approve the, uh, the new board schedule. Only the one thing with the 8 p.m. is closing. I, I doubt it. <laughs> well, that's a good goal. 5.30 to 8. Uh, well, we'll try. There's always a goal. We're going to be working on that, okay? <laughs> We're going to be doing a better job with the schedule. So we have a motion We have a motion uh, made by Nick. I'll we second. Have a second. We have a second made by Mark. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passed. Uh, to adopt the revived board, I mean, uh, the new board schedule. Moving on to educational services, uh, approve revised English language learner reclassification. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, first up, we have Raquel Hammond, who will explain a little bit about our English language learner reclassification criteria. Um, the board and uh, the district periodically review our uh, classification reclassification criteria for English learners. And uh, we've um, made a, a recommendation for a slight revision to our current criteria. And uh, Raquel will be here to explain what that is. Good evening. As you recall, I was here a couple of board meetings ago and we um, spoke about our Lexile measures and the reclassification criteria form that you have reflects the move to Lexile measures. So um, as a reminder, it was one of the pieces that we, we spoke about that we're using it for goal setting in our classrooms in addition to uh, considerations regarding moving all of our library books to have the Lexile measures on the book. So this is another way to align ourselves to um, the work that we're currently moving forward with. Um, so the reclassification of our English learners is extremely important as um, was mentioned earlier at one of the board presentations that we are doing well um, with regard to the progress of our English learners. So our goal with revising the criteria is to ensure that all of our students have that ability to be reclassified. And going back to the thought that our students, one of the criteria points is that they do receive a four on the LPAC. And we all know that the LPAC is a rigorous test for our English learners. And so that they're showing that there's uh, getting that acquisition. And so as part of the uh, reclassification criteria, Raquel brought um, the revision, the possible revisions to our leadership team, uh, principals and program managers, as well as DLAC. Um, and th the recommendation um, stands to change our local criteria 
to um, Lexiles rather than the STAR reading exam. Does anybody have any questions? No, I'll make a motion to approve this item one. The, we have a we have a motion to approve, um, made by uh, Nick. I'll second. We have a second by Joel. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion passed. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Two school accountability report cards. Um, yes, these uh, school accountability report cards are an annual requirement. Our school principals work on their uh, SARC forms and make any um, revisions that we have. You'll notice that some of the um, fields are blank and those are fields which are filled in by uh, the California Department of Education. So we're waiting for data in those fields. Uh, otherwise, it, um, the SARC reports are a way for schools to report on progress in achieving their goals, and the public and parents uh, may seek out SARC reports to evaluate and compare their schools. They're available on the CDE website. They will also be available on our website in both English and Spanish after they're submitted and completed. Does anybody have any questions? I got a ton of questions, but I don't think we want to be here all night. <laughs> um, there are a lot of reports. I'm still going through them, and I started going through them during the week when I first got the email. Uh, but nothing to bring up here. But it's just one thing is that I like the fact that we're seeing them. You should see them more often, and parents should really look at them. So They don't change much from year to year. The um, principals do go in and update, make sure that all the information, the names and the numbers are correct. Um, but for the most part, they are the same report year to year. Is this posted up at the school sites where parents can see it? Uh, yes, exactly. So they get posted on our district website and then a, a parent, I'm sorry, or a member of the public could look up and say, oh, I'm curious how many kids go to Wilson and what is their data and what, it, what happens at that school for parent education. And so it's just a way for people to be able to look up each individual school site and get some details about that school. Do I have a motion? I like the motion. Mark made a motion to approve. Do I have a second? I second it. Nick second. Uh, all in favor? All right. Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passed. Um, facilities, operations, and maintenance agreement with site lodge IQ. Okay, there we are. Um, so the uh, current operations and maintenance agreement that we have um, for our solar structures is set to expire on February 5th. Um, we did, uh, ha we had already started efforts to find um, good service at a much lesser cost. Um, part of the uh, energy project proposal that came to you um, a few meetings back, uh, uh, was a proposal for an agreement with SiteLogic to uh, provide those services. Um, we were um, we had the agreement with IEC for the last 10 years. Um, so uh, we have requested a five-year agreement with them. Uh, we are actually going to save about almost $43,000 per year based on what we had been paying for the last 10. Uh, so we're really excited about that. It does not include, it includes everything that we were getting before. It does not include uh, the washing of the solar panels, which was actually included previously and had not been uh, being done. Um, but uh, putting that in the contract would have added a lot more cost to it uh, for the amount of time uh, that we need it. We have a 90% guarantee per, uh, performance um, in our contract uh, with them or in this contract and uh, we, we can contact contract directly with a company to wash the solar panels as we as we need to. Anybody have any questions? I'll make a motion to approve uh, facility item one. Nick made a motion to approve. Do I have a second? I'll go ahead and second. I was just giving him a chance. <laughs> Uh, Mark seconded. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passed. 
Moving on to business services, Proposition 39, General Obligation Bond Annual Report. So this is the second of the audits that we bring to the board uh, for approval for the 21-22 fiscal year, our General Obligations Bond um, Audit Report. I am happy to announce that uh, it, we came back with no findings. Yay. Last year, the only thing was a recommendation to try to recruit and um, have our uh, citizens oversight committees and we have successfully been able to do so this last year so no audit findings so good very excited for that do I, does anybody have any questions do i have a motion to approve i'll make a motion brooke we have a motion made by joel fedor do i have a second i second it and seconded by nick all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passed. Um, next is the Consolidated Irrigation District Fuel Purchase Agreement. Uh, yes, so back in October, the board approved uh, two-year agreements with uh, the Consolidated Irrigation District along with the City of Selma and the Fresno County Rural Transit Authority. I always have to remember which order it goes in. Um, and um, CID's board requested revisions uh, to the property insurance and indemnification sections. I did run it by legal and then uh, legal's opinion through our property and liability group. Um, although their, um, their opinion is that uh, what they're requesting isn't an unreasonable request. It is for the uh, betterment of uh, CID's um, liability uh, purposes. Um, our liability uh, company felt that um, because they're using our facilities, he, we don't. Uh, she didn't see a need for the um, uh, dual indemnif indemnification. Um, so uh, my recommendation is to. Um, keep the current, uh, the fuel agreement that was originally um, approved by the board uh, in place um, and, and not uh, agree to the proposed revisions. Does anybody have any questions? I read it and I don't remember it saying what exactly their, their want was. I know you, it didn't work to our advantage, it was to right. our advantage, but so, what was it? The, um, the, the biggest uh, thing was the, um, they wanted, there's currently no limit on the amount of liability and they wanted a cap of 5 million. Huh. However, they're using our facilities um, and, and then and they're wanting indemnification on their part when it's actually, you know, again, our facility, our, oh, yeah. they're using our facilities. So both of them, they're not unreasonable requests, but it really just, um, it, the other two companies, the other two entities have signed it without any issues. Um, I, I don't agree that we should make an adjustment for one when the other two um, have already been signed and all three were already approved uh, by the board as is. So does this cost extra for insurance? Uh, no. It just, if something, you know, um, if, it, if it's done already with two others, it should be the same all the way across. And that's my that's my feeling too. Yes. Yeah. Do I have a motion to approve? Make a motion. To approve. To stay the way she's wanting to do it. Yeah. Where where we stay the course the way it is. That's what we're approving, right? No. What we're we approving. <laughs> yeah, because my recommendation. Well, yeah, but we're gonna. Say, you if you don't want it, if you don't, if you want it to stay the way it is, you would say no, right? To the action because we're not changing no we're, i thought it was that we're agreeing with what she wants to do correct yeah okay yes so, the recommendation is to reject the proposed right. revisions yeah okay. we're agreeing to reject yeah correct. You're okay, okay. <laughs> okay. Good thing. there you go i'll second that one. okay <laughs> so i i have a uh um motion a motion to approve to reject, yes. to reject. i make a motion change I make the motion to approve to reject. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then I have a second by Stea. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion passed. Uh, three, Sierra School Equipment proposal for ALMS cafeteria furniture. Uh, yes, so we continue our uh, move to uh, update the uh, cafeteria furniture, and ALMS's proposal is here before you. 
Um, just as a sidebar, we are working on um, Indianola and Heartland, and then we just need a, a few a few tables at Roosevelt and Eric White, and then that will complete all of the sites for, for now until the other two sites need to be replaced in the future. Okay, do we have any questions? Just how long of a process is that to get everybody up to Boston? We we intend to get we have um, our representative is going to be contacting the remaining schools so we'll be done with um, ordering the tables this year. Okay, do you have a motion to approve? Make a motion to approve uh, item three, Sierra School Equipment. Nick made an uh, a motion to approve. Do you have a second? I'll second. Joel uh, made a second to approve. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passed. Um, consent agenda. Consent uh, items listed under the consent agenda are considered to be routine or acted on by the Board of Trustees in one motion. There is no discussion of these items before the board vote unless a member of the board, staff, or public requests specific items be discussed and are removed from the consent agenda. It is understood that the administration recommends approval on all consent items. Each item on the consent agenda approved by the members of the governing board shall be deemed to have been considered in full and adopted as recommended. Before we approve it, can we just see, um, talk about the field trips? Do we know what field trips they're going to? Yeah, there's, no field trips are there's a chart. Separate item. Yeah. Huh? Field trips are a separate item. They're number six. No, they're under consent. Well, they're under they're consent. consent. Okay, so there's a chart there that shows. Yeah, it's a little. Yeah. Go in there. Um, do we have a motion? Um, Can we pull uh, number four A, please, um, and pull it separate? And then uh, there needs to be an explanation. So just pull it. Four A. Four A. A donation. I was going to thank everybody for those. <laughs> <laughs> Only that one. Oh. Okay. The rest are good. <laughs> Pulling four A from the consent agenda <laughs> and um oh okay here's our um very good thank you thank you thank you do we have a motion to approve the consent agenda oh yeah i'll make the motion mark uh made a made a um motion to approve the agenda do you have a second i'll second Estea made uh as a, made a second all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion passed. So 4A, Mrs. Kessler, would you like to speak to that, please? Well, it was um, uh, it was a combined donation from three people that I wrote the check, they in turn, mm -hmm. and I turned it in and I specifically wrote down it, but it didn't come out that way. So I just wanted it to be very clear. Mm -hmm. so, so you wanna share who, who the funds came from? Yeah, well, of course, myself, uh, uh, Max's Cafe, and uh, Dr. Tushi. Okay, thank you. Okay. So now we need to vote to approve that separately. So Okay, do I have a motion to approve uh, for, for A? a. I'll, I'll make a motion to approve for A. Okay. Nick made a motion to approve for A. Do I have a second? I'll second. Mark seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passed. Moving forward, uh, let's go to board report. Anybody have anything? Oh, um, I do. Um, I went to um, the spelling bee at Roosevelt School. Oh, thank myself. you for doing that. I enjoyed myself. It was, um, I'm sorry. Can't hear me now? Good. Much um, <laughs> Start over, Mrs. Kessler. I attended the spelling bee along with Mr. Dixon um, and um, had a really good time. It was uh, Nice to be back on my home turf there. <laughs> it was very nice to see old friends. And uh, the kids did a marvelous job. I don't know how they can keep their cool right. under such stress. <laughs> and um, I also, um, um, I don't know if any of you know, but I have a, a, a granddaughter that plays uh, varsity basketball. So I attend those basketball games. So, um, and I will, now that we have a really great basketball boys team at High so I'm going to probably be attending one of those at least because I hear they're really good. So that's what I've done, but I plan to do more next next month. But I do have, if I can throw in a little bit of a concern on uh, on the 
on, on possible security as some of those games, sometimes you get a little, you know, we have fans that are a little rowdy, but uh, so that just concerned me just a, t a tad bit. And Dr. Shepard was there watching the game with us, and it was an exciting game. Didn't you say you pick a good game to go to? <laughs> I did. Our girls won by two points, and her granddaughter is a hoot to watch. So, <laughs> so anyways, that's my little two cents. Anybody else? I thought we were talking a little bit about Ahsoka. Huh? Didn't you attend the ROP? Yeah, I did. I'm sorry. Thank you for giving me that. <laughs> thanks, thanks, bro. Uh, yeah, no, I went to the uh, okay. ROP opening at uh, Reedley High School, which happens to be my alma mater. Was kind of cool at Auto Shop. It was amazing, and that's where I met Fabrizio. And I, I'm super excited. Talked to him for a while. I was super excited to talk to him about the ROP program and what they are doing and what they want to do. And I'm really looking forward to be a part of that. So. Anyway, that's what I did. No, nothing. Mm, nothing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, moving forward. Um, Superintendent. Superintendent report. Superintendent report. So I'd like to thank Adam for your input tonight. And yes. I did follow up on getting you a microphone. It's ordered, <laughs> but it's back ordered. So just grab Mr. Medina's anytime. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, in the board letter, I mentioned February 8th as a special board meeting to have your two search companies come in and do a presentation. Um, is that going to work? It's February 8th, like at 6 o'clock? I won't be here. You won't? Okay. All right. Change it. All right. I'm going to have to um, go back to the drawing board. It's really tight getting these meetings. I mean, it took me. Never mind. I'll do it. Okay. Yeah. So we'll just have to bump it down. And... Uh like when? It, uh, when do you leave? Eight. Oh, you're leaving on the eighth. And how long were you, are you gone? Uh, I'll be back on twenty six. February. Yeah. Okay. The whole month. <clears throat> so I'll, you can do it we before. can't do it on a weekend on a Saturday. Only if I, I can see if you're willing to do it. I, I'm I, willing to do it on a Saturday. Just, everybody I don't know okay? I I just got to make sure the consultants can come. That's that's my challenge. Yeah. So you want me to check on a weekend? Yeah, I do. I don't know okay. about the rest of them. Yeah, any time. Okay. All right. Let me see. Well, and you're leaving the eighth, so okay. Yeah, I it on Saturday. Yeah. Well, shoot, shoot. Shoot. training. Because as long as it's, don't if it's early. So Saturday, yeah, some of you have signed up for training. So the only Saturday between it's too short of a time frame for me to do it this Saturday because they have to have lead time. So be February third, which is. Some people have really he, signed up. You think they could be here in an hour if you call? Mm -hmm. sure, yeah, tonight. Have holiday. I can see if I can. Maybe. It's just whether they're available. <laughs> I'll see what I can do to okay. get eight eight sooner than later. And I'm glad that um, Mrs. Kessler mentioned the basketball, but I'm going to tell you if you want to see a great, both the girls and the boys, but our boys basketball team is really good. And we do have our rival. I'm taking care of security <laughs> on Wednesday night. There'll be two police officers there. Is like, this Wednesday? Yep. Seven o'clock. Um, and I just want to acknowledge and thank the, um, Dr. Wildman's told me that they had a great LCAP input meeting and the pseudo representatives were there and it had some great dialogue and input. So NCSE? Okay, NCSE. I didn't know that, but. It was a great meeting and the input was really invaluable. And we had our district spelling bee that was really cool too. So uh, that will be, um, it was a lot of fun. So, okay, I'll work on the dates and get back to you as soon as possible. Okay, now we're um, number 12. Uh, we're gonna go into closed session at 8.39. Thank you everyone.